Good morning. In compliance with notification requirements of Ohio's open meeting law and section 101.021 of the Codified Ordinance of Cleveland, Ohio, 1976, notice of this meeting has been publicly posted. All boards and commissions under the purview of the city planning department conduct its meetings according to Robert's Rules of Order. Actions during the meeting will be taken by voice vote. Abstentions from any vote due to a conflict of interest should be stated for the record prior to the taking of any vote. In order to ensure that everyone participating in the meeting has the opportunity to be heard, we ask that you use the raise hand feature before asking a question or making a comment. The raise hand feature can be found in the participants panel on the desktop and mobile version and activated by clicking the hand icon. Please wait for the chair or facilitator to recognize you and be sure to select unmute and announce yourself before you speak. When finished speaking, please lower your hand by clicking on the raise hand icon again and mute your microphone. We will also be utilizing the chat feature to communicate with participants. The chat feature can be activated by clicking the chat button located on the bottom of the WebEx screen. Call-in users can unmute by using star six. All meeting activity is being recorded via the WebEx platform. These proceedings are also being live streamed via YouTube. All requests to speak on a particular matter via our website and email have been considered. We have also received emails from those who have provided written comment on a particular matter. Mr. Chairman, the meeting is yours. Thank you very much. Before we get started, I just want to all the presenters today keep your uh, presentations brief. We've reviewed all of your uh, presentations in advance of the meeting. We're going to lose our quorum at noon, and for other people later on in the agenda, uh, for their sake, um, please keep it brief. Michael, call the roll, please. Bowen. Present. Counting. Present. Fluker. Fluker. I see you, but I can't hear you. Uh, Looks like you're me. muted, August. Still can't hear you, sir. Hmm. No, it doesn't. You're not muted. Hmm. And Michael, turn up your volume. It's hard to hear you. Sorry about that. Just raise your hand, August. Uh, Curry. Present. Trey Scott. Present. Paul. Present. Life. Mr. Chairman, we have a absent. Yes. Okay, the first one is a lot lot consolidation, lot split, permanent parcel number 003. 32097. This is uh, at 1745 West 31st Street place. Who's here for this one? Mr. Chairman, he was having trouble getting in. It's uh, Kevin Robinette, but he I just sent him the link again. Boris, is he on? Um, I'm not seeing him, but no, I don't see him. Maybe we skip him, go to the next one. Morris, let me know when he gets on and then I'll, we'll try to I'll, fit him in. I'll we'll keep an eye out. For me? I'll keep an eye out. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, the next is appeal from a decision of planning commission, new townhouse and a two family district. This is, uh, it was disapproved December 20th, 2019. Current parcel number 0 0 2 3 5 1 1 6 and 1 1 7. This is at 4705 Bridge Avenue. Who's here for this one? 
Hi, um, Hannah Cohan with Knez Homes. And uh, Tony Coyne and Catherine Weber, we're land use counsel for Knez Homes. Welcome. Go ahead, please. Okay, I'm gonna, I would like to start off with just giving a little procedural uh, explanation, and then Hannah will take you through the um, the site plan and the elevations. Um, this is sort of an unusual matter in the sense that this project had actually at one time received approval of the Planning Commission, then went to the Board of Zoning Appeals because of some issues really with uh, participation and um, went back to city planning and, and then was turned down. Uh, we took the matter on an administrative appeal to the uh, Common Police Court in Cuyahoga County. And during the process with the Court of Appeals on the administrative appeal, we participated in a mediation um, process. And I'll just leave it that sometimes you can resolve matters that way, um, but under the city's code uh, with the city's uh, legal counsel, it became uh, apparent that that would be cumbersome to do and that it would be best to simply just reapply to the Planning Commission with the, uh, the new um, site um, and I wanted to uh, tell you uh, a little bit about that and then have Hannah do the presentation. But as you may recall, um, this was a former heroin dealer um, that was closed down. It was a gas station and it was sort of a front. It was closed down and about a dozen people went to uh, prison on a federal investigation. Uh, Mr. Kinez and Mr. Makito acquired the property thereafter. Um, and because it was an old gas station site, it was pretty significantly contaminated. They've probably, between the acquisition of the property and the co addressing contamination, they've invested about a half a million dollars into the site. So they came in with what was a code compliant townhouse development. Um, the original uh, site was approved by Near West Local Design uh, in, in August of 19. And then um, the rest of the procedure that I mentioned took place. As part of our discussion with the um, uh, with the city, we um, we were aware that there's a proposed townhouse code um, that's been introduced and will revise the current code. Um, so it's technically not in effect. But what we ask the architect to do is to see how we can be more sensitive to the new code that has not yet. Uh, been passed. So we revised the site plan and some of the uh, amenities to include some of those provisions. Um, we've eliminated a unit to put in an interior yard green space, but the the setbacks are close to what the uh, revised townhouse code uh, provides for, and that would include the front yard depth. The views were only a foot off what the new code provides. Um, and the first floor glazing, we, we meet that uh, code, that part of the code. And we also have uh, improved the landscape elements around the site. Again, it, it's, it's, um, it's, not, it's not a, um, um, a typical uh, site plan for this. And we've also included what they consider to be human scale materials for the, for the paving of the auto court. So that is, all um, permeable pavers, 100%. In fact, and the code only requires 60%. So, it was our view that this was a step up from the prior plan, and we were suggested to refile with the planning commission. Uh, Ohio City Inc. has no objection to this uh, new plan, and we're here to request planning commission to approve it. That's the background. If you want to ask me any questions about the background, I'd be glad to answer them. Otherwise, I would just uh, suggest we have Hannah present the, the uh, revised plan. So, Tony, when you said uh, Ohio City review this, do you mean planning or I mean design review? At Ohio, Ohio, Ohio City Inc. Um, has no objection to it. They did not have a meeting on it, and we went back to them um, for comment. But we were advised that they just would take no, they had no objection. Uh, to it proceeding, and again, they're aware that it's it's um, being um, developed under the the current townhouse code. Um, it's my understanding that there's some uh, advocacy to revise the townhouse code even further than the city's current 
proposed uh, legislation, which has not yet been passed. I don't, I don't know what that is, uh, Mr. Chairman, but that's that's what we were we were advised. So um, we're we're here to request approval from the Planning Commission on on this um, on this project. Thanks, Tony. Any other commission members? In David, before there was a presentation, so the updates to the code that we approved a few months ago have not been passed by city council. Yeah, Can someone verify that? Like, I want someone to verify before they present yeah. that the updates no. we made to the code no. yeah. did not I, get passed by council. Yeah, look, if I can answer, my understanding it has not been, but somebody else can verify it, but also. Because of when the application went in, it we would have been proceeding right. the adoption. Isn't this a new application you just said? It is technically a new application, it's but we're still. And, but I, I need to know from Freddie if that legislation passed or no, not. No, no, it has not passed council yet. Okay. Because the interesting thing is with the with the new townhouse code, there is a. a a provision in there to post a sign to uh, announce to the residents that you know this is looking forward to move forward. So that would then comply, obviously. But okay, let's see the presentation. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair can you hear me? Careful about our time. Mr. Chair, yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Um, I don't want to conflate two things. And I, I don't think the new townhouse code matters here, so I don't think we should keep referring to it. In my opinion, because I think we're going to, we need to, in my opinion, review this based upon its, its merits currently. Um, that's just my opinion. Thank you. Thanks, if, I, if I can comment on that, Mr. Chairman to Mr. Fluker, uh, I, I agree with you. I was, I was just explaining that that was a suggestion we were in mediation because we still are in court. If we are, uh, you know, successful in getting this approved, we'll obviously dismiss that case. But we were asked to at least take a look at the proposed code to be more sensitive to that, and that's that's why I mentioned it. But you are correct; we're technically we're under the current code, not the new proposed code. Okay, go ahead with the presentation, please. All right. Um, if you could just go to the next slide, please. So we are located at the intersection of 47th and Bridge. Um, next slide. As um, Tony mentioned, it's a vacant lot. It used to be an auto parts shop that had a um, little bit of a checkered background. There's our site there, the two parcels. Um, there's no buildings currently on it. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. We just have some context photos. Um, we could probably scroll through these um, again in the interest of brevity. These are townhouses that are on the nearby blocks showing the context for townhouses, particularly on bridge and in this area of Ohio city as bridges. Um, more of a transition street between the residential and commercial areas of the neighborhood. Next slide please. Um, this is just a diagram of the site showing um, our area showing other mid to high density developments in the area, as well as commercial and um, institutional or industrial properties in the neighborhood. So, um, as you can see, there's a particular context for these higher density areas to be located on the corners. Uh, next slide, please. This is a map of the setbacks of the adjacent buildings. Um, we measured everything. This was determined in conjunction with city planning staff to be an RA3 townhouse district. So those are the setbacks that we're using. Next slide, please. And this is just um, a zoomed out version of that density map. So you can see further development, particularly up and down bridge, again, on the corners where you'll find other townhouse or commercial buildings. Next slide, please. This is another diagram showing the adjacent setbacks, um, again, showing where the RA3 minimum maximums hit all of the buildings on the neighboring blocks. 
Next slide, please. This is the site plan that we submitted previously. Um, just as a refresher, we had two buildings with 12 townhouse units. Um, this is what was both approved and disapproved at separate meetings from the planning commission previously and what also went through the design review process and all of our neighborhood meetings. Um, this was completely compliant with the zoning code. You can see our zoning analysis there. So it meets all of the requirements. Um, we'll go to the next um, slide, please. This is our new site plan that we're presenting. So we've made some changes. We're trying to um, be sensitive to some of the comments we've received. And as Tony mentioned, um, some of the provisions in the upcoming townhouse code to try to meet with the spirit of that as best we can on this site that we've already purchased. Um, so the big change is we took out a unit. So we're down from 12 units to 11 units. Instead of two larger buildings, we have one large building and then two smaller buildings. Um, you can see on those interior frontage units, we've added a green space in between units eight and nine for some landscaping. Um, we have also shrunk the footprint of all of the interior frontage units. So they're as absolutely small as we can make them in order to increase those rear setbacks. So we've increased our setback to the interior frontage um, front yard setback, as well as the interior side yard setback um, to again, be more sensitive to the neighboring property and add a more gracious buffer from our project to the neighbors. Um, we have also um, redone the auto court area to change the materials. We're proposing a colored stamped concrete to give the feeling of a decorative brick. Um, we've also added landscape areas in between the garages and landscaping as much as we can inside that auto court area. We have brick garden walls with stone caps and also matching brick and stone capped piers that shield the entry into the auto court and block your view to, again, enhance the um, visual experience of that area as much as possible. Um, next slide, please. So what we're proposing today is still completely compliant with the current zoning code. We are not anticipating any variances. Um, on the right, you'll see, um, as, as Tony mentioned, just um, the particular items highlighted that we are being sensitive to from the new proposed townhouse code. So we're meeting um, or very near to meeting all of those new requirements, including the MUSE entrances. When we split the back building into two buildings, we have now complied with um, the future requirement of a MUSE unit having no more than three shared walls. So uh, we felt that was important. Um, next slide, please. And this is just a clean version of our current site plan without the, um, the notes about the changes. So it's a little bit clearer to read. Next slide, please. This is a typical floor plan. Um, the units are 3 levels. You have a office or flex area on the 1st floor, your main living space on the 2nd floor. Um, bedroom level on the third floor, and each unit has a little penthouse leading to a private roof deck for some private outdoor space. Next slide, please. So the front of the building, um, the units facing on bridge are, should be pretty familiar to what was previously approved. We haven't changed those significantly, but just to recap, we are using um, a thin brick material on all of the street facing facades here. Um, the brick you'll see later in the renderings is a two tone with a darker buff on the first level and then a lighter cream brick above. We have large, um, expansive glass, um, tons of windows in these units. Um, the units facing on bridge, you can see some of them have Juliet balconies with a decorative custom metal railing. Um, as we turn the side, there are some bays to help articulate the side of the building and break up the massing a bit. Next slide, please. Um, this is an interior view. We are using an upgraded garage door, so it will be a carriage style door with glass in it. Um, lots of glass on all sides of these buildings. Next slide, please. Um, you can see on the top, that's the front of the interior facing units, units 7 through 11. Um, the two that are closest to 47th, the brick wraps entirely, so those are 
brick all the way up. The three um, units towards the back of the site are brick on the first floor, and then we've switched to a lap siding above. And we're also using that lap siding and some of the um, interior facades that are not close to the street. Um, next slide, please. This is our material palette. Um, again, on the left, you can see our two colors of brick. The darker buff is for the base of the building and the cream is above it. We have um, a sage color for our lap siding and just a, a cream for all of the trim. You can see some of the decorative metal elements at the bottom and also towards the right, the stamped concrete look that we are proposing for the auto court. Um, we're also using a black window for this. Next slide, please. So these are um, views from Bridge looking at the front building units one through six. Um, I didn't mention before, these units all have porches, um, which was something that was important to the neighborhood. So we made sure to keep that as a, an important part of our design. Next slide, please. Some uh, more views, the top one again from Bridge, and then at the bottom starting to see the side of the building on 47. 47. You'll see that the porch for both the porches for both of the units that have um, frontage on 47 are wrapping around the corner. So we have a corner wraparound porch on both of those. Um, next slide, please. These are some views into the auto court and showing some of the elements, the landscaping, the garden walls with the stone caps that I mentioned before. Um, we have extensive decorative lighting and um, we just put some of the items from the townhouse code that dictate what um, we need to be complying with for the auto court and show that we are in full compliance with those items. Um, next slide, please. And then this is an aerial view of the, the project um, showing some of the neighboring houses as well. And uh, that, that's it. If we have uh, any questions on the design. Commission members. Um, I have a question if you could go back to the site plan. Um, I wondered if you considered um, instead of having seven and eight separated, nine, 10 and 11 is actually having seven, eight and nine together with the gap being closer to the existing residence for light and air. So it seems to me that that should be flipped. So that I think the idea is to sort of not only break it up, but help with the sort of proximity of the ex existing residence. So did you consider that? And could you consider that, which would be to, um, to kind of flip this as three, then the gap, then two? Yeah, we, we would certainly be be fine with making that change. Um, the unit seven and eight were grouped together because they were both brick originally. So that was more of a natural breaking point, but there's there's no problem on our side for changing the aggregation of units there. So. Other commission members? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, now we can. Go ahead, August. I think we missed an opportunity here, and, and I'm not advocating that you redesign your townhomes, but I truly believe that there should always be some sort of pedestrian acknowledgement. Man door, it just doesn't happen. I mean, I just see people coming in, pulling in their garages, the garage door shut, and it's it's just it's 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 just a double loaded parking lot, in my opinion. But it is what it is. So, hopefully, in in the future, we can advocate for that um, a little more aggressively. I mean, it's it's interesting you bring that up. That is the biggest difference between this uh, meeting the, the new code, because that's why I asked about the new code. So I'd love to know why the new code has not passed, because the new code, as you recall, August, uh, will require a man door, um, because, uh, you know, this is probably the third project that Kinev has proposed that has this sort of situation, which I believe is not only unsafe, it's 
on it's just not a great way to live. So um, we have rectified that in the new code, which is really why I wanted to know that. Um, uh, so to Freddie, I'd love to know why the new code hasn't passed. This is also a new um, application, so it would have applied, but um, for some reason, the the new code has not passed. Yeah, and it has to go before council to pass. So it's class planning commission, and uh, the next step in that process is council committee. So that's right. a question for council. And I mean, that is raise the that question. biggest change in what we approved, which is to not allow this condition. But it, you know, uh, the, the, it hasn't passed, so um, it's unfortunate. If I could I just that. address that, if, if that's all right. Um, for the new proposed townhouse code, the second entrance is required when a MUSE unit has three or more shared walls. So this actually does comply with the entry requirement for the new proposed town code as is. It doesn't have any MUSE units with more than three shared, three or more shared walls. So that wouldn't be required that required for this site plan even under the new code. That's a good point. And the other thing too uh, that we consider when they. Uh, resubmitted this is keep in mind that this thing passed originally. And when we have the other conversation, as they move toward the spirit of the new code, even though this it has not passed, it checked the boxes of a number of the features that were articulated in the new code, which is even more in the step of moving in the right direction, even though it's not law yet. So we saw that as a plus, and I think that is in part uh, why we are hearing this today, uh, because it is a departure from the original uh, proposal, which received approval originally, um, and moves toward the uh, uh, articulation of what we would like to see in the new townhouse code update, even though it is not officially law yet. Yeah, I, th I think my biggest problem with besides obviously the motor court, which has always been an angst for planning commission, is it sits so heavy on the site, it seems out of context. It's very flat, very heavy. Um, thank God there's a lot of windows in it, but um, that's what bothers me most about it. It's just a big mass, flat mass. Any other comments? What does planning commission want to do with this one? Um, I'm going to move to approve it as presented. I'll second it. Um, how about Lillian's comment about the flip? About the what? Pushing nine towards eight and putting the gap closest to the existing residence. Yes, yes, I think, I believe the applicant had, had agreed to, to, to do that. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Okay, so I would like to amend my motion to include um, Ms. Curry's comment concerning flipping the units as, as a condition of the approval. Okay, we have a motion and a second further discussion. Michael, call the roll. Owen. No. Downing. No. Fluker. Yes. Curry. No. Ray Scott. No. Paul. Yes. It sounds like it didn't pass. That's right. Mr. What it Michael. sounds like to me, sir. Michael, that's correct, Mr. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. It did not pass. It was disapproved. All right. It didn't pass. Is there any other motions, or are we moving on? I do have a comment concerning this this forthcoming legislation under for a new townhouse code. I guess I misunderstood the requirement 
for for man doors. So th we could see this continue happening if that's my understanding of the new code. With, where we just essentially create auto court. So I just I just wanted to uh, make that known, and, and maybe um, there's there's a way to adjust it so that it doesn't create what we're seeing happening here, because I think that's what we're trying to avoid. Uh, if I could, could I comment? Yes, go ahead, Tony. Yeah, just one, I'm very disappointed. Um, this is completely code compliant and the commission doesn't have unfettered discretion. Um, I was going to say uh, that, uh, and so we're still in court, so we'll let the court system, I guess, run its course, which would be the other plan, by the way, not this plan. Um, but I also think that before the townhouse code that's being amended goes further, there should be a clear understanding as to its impact. Um, other uh, developers are unsure of its status. Uh, I'd be glad to look at it in more detail, given some of the uh, goals that it sounds like the commission thought it has in it. Um, but uh, I just would request uh, an opportunity to look at that at some time. I'd be glad to volunteer and, and do that. Um, I don't know what kind of community input from developers uh, and people investing in our city have, um, but uh, that to me is very, very important to be collaborative on a new code like that. Um, especially given the city's desire to repopulate sections of our of our town, but I'm disappointed in the decision, um, and we'll let the court process proceed. I guess. Yeah, and, and Tony, I mean, from from my standpoint, I voted against it because I don't feel it fits within the context of the the neighborhood there, and I, I think I said that. I, I can't speak for the other commission members, but um, I'm not against the density at all. And I think they made some strides forward. I just think it sits way too heavy on the site and is too clunky uh, from the street and pedestrian area to fit within the context of the rest of the environment. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'll just say that's what the zoning code is for. That's why one follows the zoning code. That's why esteemed architects like Mr. Fluker look at the zoning code first. That's that's what you that's what you do. That way you don't have questions about arbitrariness and capriciousness. And I think it's important that we try to do that. And if we're going to change the code, I'm, I'm all for that, too, so that you can follow it. But you can't have uh, somebody who's spending this kind of money investing in our city with because you, you don't like it. You know, I mean, it just doesn't it doesn't pass, uh, I think, the reasonableness test. But uh, the, the commission has a job to do. And if that's how it wants to proceed, that's that's understood. But um uh, I can only say we're disappointed. We'll let the court process uh, go forward and uh, and address it at that at that time. Okay, let's move forward. I mean, yeah, we need to keep on going. So um, let's go to the next one, which is um, townhouse development in the two-family district permit parcel number zero zero four one seven one three seven. This is at uh, 2494 Thurman Avenue. Who's here for this one, please? Hi, I'm Jill Brandt. Good morning, Jill. Hi, uh, I'm the architect and we have, uh, I believe two of the investors are have called in. Um, so they're on the line as well. Um, okay, thank you. Go ahead. So we are, uh, we have a parcel in uh, Tremont on Thurman Avenue, it's sort of a mid block. Um, this area is a mix of single family homes and uh, townhome style. Um, if you can go to the next slide, you can see the overview. We're sort of in the middle of the block, um, surround uh, some townhomes on each side of us. Um, in the next photo, please. You can see some context of the street. Um, so currently, it's an empty lot. Um, in the next photo, you'll see our site plan. So we are building four units. Uh, two are uh, butted and mirror image on the other side. Um, I believe we, we did submit the townhouse um, checklist, and I believe we comply. Um, we have all our setbacks, um, trying to maintain, you know, a nice, friendly, welcoming street frontage with uh, the Front facing units have uh, entry porches and doors. We're set back 10 feet. 
we've got some landscaping in that area, um, some landscaping around the driveway. Um, we do have, you know, the parking court with the uh, garages on the side. Um, try to keep the concrete paving there as minimal as we can. We do have man doors for the back units on that side as well. Similarly, replicating the front porch and door configuration on the front uh, where we could. Um, in the next photo, you'll see some sample site plan, uh, floor plans. Again, we have a garage and a flex space on the first floor. Um, second floor is uh, living space, uh, dining kitchen, uh, half bath. On the upper floor, we have two bedrooms, bath and laundry, and then each unit has an, um, a deck. Um, and the next photo, please. We have our elevations. Um, again, our goal was to make sure that we kept with the uh, scale of the neighborhood. Uh, we have a stair tower and um, we try to keep the gable again to keep the massing down. We have a variety of materials. We'll be looking at using um, a dry bit uh, for the bulk of the proper um, of that front facade area, uh, a panel board. Uh, we're still determining which particular we're going to be using, but it will be a, a wood look siding, either you know something along the line of the, the Nichihas raised green or a wood siding. Um, and then we have uh, dark windows. We'll have some panel board. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you'll see the side railing, uh, the side view. Again, we're using that gable to break up the mass. Variety of materials. We'll have some brick around the garage doors. Um, and some glass railing, I think, is what we're leaning towards right now. And I think the next photo might have some renderings that show a little more of our color palette. So we'll be using a soft white natural wood look, a little pop of color on the door. Um, I think that's it. I don't know if you have any questions. Commission members. Move approval, Downing. Second. Oops. We have motion second, further discussion. Michael, call the roll, please. Owen. Owen. Yes. Downing. Downing. Yes. Hooker. Yes. Three. Yes. Yeah. Scott. Yes. Paul. Yes. Thank you. Good luck. Great. Thank you. The Moss residence, uh, this is at West 28th Street um, near York Court. Who's here for this one? I'm here, Mr. Chair, Wes Harper. Hey, Wes, go ahead, please. Hey, uh, I was hoping to uh, postpone this submission. Uh, we've got some things we, we'd like to work out before uh, we'll present it. So, uh, hoping you so, could. Uh, so, do you want us to table it? To, Wes, yeah. do you want us to table it to a date certain? Or do you uh, want us to keep it open? I'm sorry, can you give me the second option? Or just keep it open, just table it, and then you go back to staff. Yeah, that works. Okay. I, I moved the table of. Applicant's proposal. I'll second Downing. Motion second. Michael, call the roll, please. Owen. Owen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Hooker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Trey Scott. Yes. Paul. Yes. Motion carries. Um, see you later, Wes. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Mandatory referrals. Uh, this is ordinance number 839-2021, uh, authorizing the director of public works to enter into a lease with landmarks at the lake LLC or its designee for development of apartment units and parking on a portion of permanent parcel number 105-02-002A for the term of 93 years authorizing the director to enter into a property adoption agreement with LL55 Park LLC for its approved designee to improve and maintain the public park located on portions of 105020002A that is adjacent to the leased area for a term of 93 years 
and authorizing the director of public works to enter into a submerged land lease with the state of Ohio for these portions of permanent parcel number 10502002A for a term of 90 year, 99 years. Uh, Jamie, are you here? Yes, good morning, Chairman. Jamie DeRosa, Commissioner of Real Estate for the city. I'll be presenting this today. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so this, um, and the next one, yep. So this ordinance relates to the Landmark at the Lake apartment project, which has come before Planning Commission for schematic design. Um, it did not, their schematic design did not include any of the park improvements um, because we were still working out this, um, uh, the, uh, the transfer um, that you're gonna hear about today. So in future iterations, you'll see the more details on the park design. Um, but uh, the Landmark of the Lake apartment project is just east of the Shoreline Apartments, which is formerly uh, Key 55, which you see on the, uh, the east side of the, the photograph there. Um, the city owns the land that, um, uh, it's kind of the rougher area of the land that you the see uh, to the right of the photograph there. And the developer owns the, the land that's uh, sort of nice and smooth in the middle. And that's where the, uh, the landmark at the lake uh, apartment project is going to be constructed. Um, so currently the city's land, um, again, the rougher area is with the, within the, the Metro Parks' lakefront uh, lease, uh, but it's unimproved. And so the city intends to remove it from the Metro Parks' lease and then uh, work with the developer on the, in the, on the improvements that we'll discuss today. So you could go to the next slide. Um, this kind of breaks down the area. Next slide, please. Yeah, this kind of breaks down the area. So you see key 55 on the left, the development area in the middle. Um, so a portion of the city's uh, parkland is uh, vacated East 55th Street. Originally 55th Street went all the way to the lake. That was vacated a few years ago and all of that land uh, came to the city. Um, and I would like to point out, you can see a little stick in the water. Um, that's where uh, the sewer district has an operation. And uh, that's an ongoing operation to remove uh, what they call floatables um, from their system as, as, as they have outfalls into the lake. And then to the east of that is the 55th Street Marina. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is just a photograph kind of from a different angle so that we see, uh, uh, you can see the East 55th Street Marina um, to the right, um, just for context. Next slide, please. Um, so what we're uh, what we're speaking about is a property adoption agreement, which is typically how we allow developers to improve uh, park space, and uh, we've worked with city planning on how these park amenities would be constructed, and it would include uh, tying in a piece of the bike path um, into this little park space. Um, our goal at the city is to have better um, access to the lake, and so that's really our goal for. Um, getting uh, this uh, redeveloped by the by the developer. Um, the piece of um, the the vacated 55th Street that they would like to construct some parking on would be through a lease. And then this entire area is uh, filled uh, land. So we would need a submerged land lease from the state of Ohio for um, these construction activities to, to occur. So next slide, please. Um, so this kind of splits out um, where the lease area is versus the property adoption area. Um, and of note, uh, you could see there's a carve out to the east. That's where the sewer district needs exclusive use of that area. Um, and um, and then you could see that the East 55th Street right away right of way lines up with that lease area um, that's furthest west on the city's property. Next slide. So, um, again, this will come back to planning commission and future iterations of the project, but this just kind of shows you how the parking ties into their project and, um, how the bike, uh, path kind of goes in the middle of 2 berms that would be proposed a landscaping berm to kind of shield the park from both the parking and from the sewer district activities. 
um, with a little parklet and, and a little, um, you know, access um, a way for the public to access this area, which currently um, is is not 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 really accessible. So this is this is the last slide that I have for you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and um, it's been a process that we've been working through with city planning and the developer, and uh, and and so we think this will be a nice amenity um, once that development happens. Thanks, Jamie. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Yeah, just to add to Jamie's comment, um, this was uh, one of these uh, projects. Uh, we are not necessarily uh, excited about having uh, you know private development on our public waterfront. And, and, and creating more of that, but we were able to go back and forth working with this development interest to ensure that public access was maintained. And uh, it took a lot of back and forth, uh, but we do believe that we get some benefit uh, from this investment, uh, maintaining the water's edge and also linking up with our bicycle network um, in this geography. The other uh, piece uh, that's important, you know, about this, uh, this is uh, very close to uh, 55th Street, which we're trying to create more lakefront access for residents uh, to neighborhoods to the south. So as we continue to build out the bicycle connections from 9th Street out to uh, uh, Gordon Park, um, we want to try to create linkages as much as possible. And uh, we believe that this is a, a marketing uh, opportunity for the development interest as well to be on the trail system. So uh, I want to highlight um, that fact because uh, these transactions, um, we have to scratch and claw uh, for every inch of uh, 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 opportunity that we can uh, to create that access to the waterfront. Thank you. I move, I move well, approval. Second. 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 McCray Scott. Okay, we have a motion and second. Further discussion? Michael, call the roll, please. Owen. Yes. Wait, um, sorry, David. I have a couple questions, just quick ones, if it's okay. A couple questions. Sure, go ahead. Um, first, and they're quick ones. Um, is the developer paying for this? He's paying for it. Oh, right. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, Lillian. So the developer is paying for these improvements. And then for the life of the 93 year lease and property adoption agreement, they'll be paying for the maintenance of these improvements. Okay. Um, so that that was also 1 of the benefits that we at the city received from this okay. proposal. And they will be doing it in a timely fashion from. As they develop the site, so it's not like a future. It's now they are yes. required to do it as part of this. Yeah, um, so it would, you know, it would be as they finish their apartment project, um, clearly they're going to, you know, lots of construction activity happening, but as they finish their project, they'll do this so that it's all coordinated with a completion date. Okay. Now, my second question is, um, and I might, my memory isn't great about this area, although I've been along it. Um, will there be additional enhancements to, let's say, the connective piece that is along the um, marginal there, meaning that um, if you went back to the other map, part of the issue there was the gap that was created by the original development. So, can you address that just like one more time yes. to understand it? Yep. So, um, that is something that we're actively addressing and working towards, which would be a bike trail that would be um, off of North Marginal Road. So, just to the north of North Marginal Road to separate the cars from folks that want to run and bike. And so we do have a plan uh, with the Metro Parks to make that connection from the 55th Street Marina over to East 9th Street. And there is um, a piece of the trail that would need to go into the area where Key 55 has parking just north of, of North Marginal Road. And so we have um, we we don't have an agreement um, signed, but we do have an agreement in in concept that this development will add parking that would allow the developer to lose some of the parking uh, just north of the Key 55 building, and um, then that would be incorporated into this larger park um, or this larger bike path um, project. Um, and if you, 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 you look at it, in, go ahead. 
Jamie, I mean, the reason I'm asking is that you're giving them the store before you've negotiated the access, <laughs> meaning that that was what was the sticking point before. So, although I'm happy they're agreeing to this and paying for it, but you still can't get there um, till you negotiate the other agreement, which I'm hearing is not negotiated. So, I, although I'm very thankful for this, it only matters if you have the bike path, right? So, is this cart before the horse? Well, that that's a great point. So, their their argument would be that they're two different. Uh, Corporate entities that have some shared partners. Our argument is that those shared partners should be able to uh, give us the agreement that we need um, to move forward. Um, the couple pieces here that that to point out is that their parking is within an encroachment permit area, which can be revoked by council at any time. So that's that's one piece of it. It's not private property that they're parking on. It's city property that they have an encroachment park permit. Um, to, to use um, the second point is that this bike path, even if nothing else happens, will still connect it to East 55th Street Marina, which is still a benefit to the public. But I'm hearing you loud and clear, and I'll work, um, you know, hard to try to get uh, an agreement tied to this uh, to this uh, development um, for that area with in front of Key 55. Yeah, I mean, my prop, my preference would be, although there's a motion in a second, would be that both of these be signed at the same time because the incentive, since it is a complicated ownership agreement, I mean, the bigger goal for me is, although this is great, I just I want a continuous lakefront bike path, and the only leverage that you have is actually this. Um, so, um, and I also know that with priorities and things like the city, the idea of the city then coming back and removing the encroachment per permit and forcing that seems very like unlikely to me, even though they could. So I, I'm okay what my commission members want to do, but my preference would have been for you to bring these both in together and 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 that we had a continuous lakefront because it is your only leverage. Excuse me, if I may I make a comment? This is Mike Carney from Landmark. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mike, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I completely under, understand your point, but there is no holding us to the fire. We have a long track right, record of doing uh, what I believe is great work in the city of Cleveland. Uh, I can tell you for the key 55 portion of this project, and as Jamie said, he's completely right. They are two entities with two different owners. Uh, however, we control both parts. Uh, the continuation of this bike path is in the best interest of the existing project. It's also in the best interest of the new project. Uh, but quite frankly, <clears throat> until we can get this agreement signed, which we've been working on for over a year, uh, there will be no new project. We need this in order to get a market study and to get a loan to get the new project. So you can call it a chicken, chicken or an egg thing. Uh, but this is absolutely essential to us moving forward. So, uh, to you then, a question: Are you on the record here today saying that you will build the continuous bike path um, across the marginal? Is that are you saying that on the record today? I, I am not saying that on the record because the Metro Parks has said that they will build it. I will say on the record that we do have an agreement with the Metro Parks that we will offset the parking that is currently in the public encroachment. I will say that on the record. Okay, that's enough for me. I mean, you're saying that on the record. I know the Metro Park's gonna pay for it, but you're gonna agree to that and to shift the parking. Yes. On both projects. Lillian, there's no conflict on the on the new project. Okay, but I'm saying that not just the new one. I'm talking about the the, the gap. You're talking about both of them. Is that on true? The short, yeah, on the, the shoreline, the, the bike path, the bike path will be continuous. Uh, some of it will be at our cost. Some of it will be at Metro Parks. Um, but yes, that that is a that is a part of of both of these projects coming together. Uh, I, Lillian, I know it's been a long time since you heard this last. Um, but the whole idea and concept is to combine these two projects um, as, as if they are one. And yes, the continuous bike path is a part of that. 
Okay, that's all I needed to hear. And I thank you for that. Um, obviously, you know, I'm passionate about this and it's been a long time coming. So well, I just you know really what? wanted you to hear that. To so thank you. Me, you thank know. you. You're welcome. Okay. okay, Michael, continue, please. Hurry. Uh, yes. Craig Scott. Yes. Paul. Yes. Okay. Ordinance number 898-2021, authorizing the director of capital projects to lease certain portions of certain pro properties located under the Superior Viaduct Arch, number four, to John Textoris Jr. and Sarah Textoris for the purpose of a yard expansion. Who's here for this one? Good morning, yeah. Suzanne yeah, DeGenero with the Mayor's Office of Capital Projects, Division of Real Estate. Hey, uh, hi. Um, so I have some, this, this, the lease area is actually underneath arch four of the superior viaduct. And I have some photos um, to kind of help you better understand where it's located. Um, if you, yes, that's great. Um, so the text forest residence, as you can see is, um, the second um, townhouse in from the corner, um, the arch four, you can see in the back is sort of adjacent to their backyard. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is a, a picture from grade uh, level right behind their residence. And as you can see, they've they've improved it. They've been maintaining it for um, 15 or 20 years. They've lived there for a long time and they approached the city to formalize, uh, actually enter into a formal lease with us. Um, the area is about 5,600 square feet. Um, and so we'd like to lease it to them for a period of five years. Um, they would be uh, uh, obviously required to continue maintaining and improving the space, but any improvements that they make would be subject to city approval. Um, and we uh, appreciate your hearing this. Thank you. Commission members? Move approval, Downing. Second, Paul. Motion and second. Further discussion? Michael, call the roll. Bowen. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Trey Scott. Yes. Paul. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Ordinance number 913-2021. Authorizing the mayor and the commissioner of purchase and supply to acquire the mound school and property located at 5405 Mound Avenue for future redevelopment for the Department of Community Development to convey the property to Morbido Enterprises, Inc. or its designee to enter into an agreement between the city and the redeveloper. Who's here for this one? Uh, I am uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm James Green. I'm with the Department of Community Development. I'm the Commissioner of Neighborhood Development. And I'm also joined by Chris Alvarado from Slavic Village Development Corporation. And I see that Ben Morbido is on the line as well. Uh, this, this piece uh, is a request by the department. Um, we've worked with the Cleveland Metropolitan School District around 19 sites that they own that are currently no longer needed by the district where they're seeking opportunities for redevelopment. The sites include 12 former school buildings and an additional seven uh, groupings that are all vacant land. The mound site is one of those vacant land pieces. So the city uh, has worked with CMSD to issue RFP, a request for proposal, They've evaluated and scored those proposals and made awards based on winning proposals. The development team out of the applicants for the mound site that was awarded this site is um, a partnership between Slavic Village Development Corporation and, um, and Morabito Enterprises Incorporated. And just a little background, the school district did receive appraisals on all of the sites 
uh, that they were looking to unload. And uh, each of those um, uh, appraised amounts were put in each of the, um, into the RFP. So the uh, developer that's chosen that was awarded the, uh, for each site is able to purchase the site at the appraised value or negotiated price. In this case, this development team agreed to the appraised value of 38,000 for the Mound School property. Now their proposal is to acquire the, uh, the Mound School site, which is at 55th, it's the, the um, highlighted portion there, 55th and, um, and Mound. And um, it, it, as part of uh, a land assembly. And, and sort of the caveat to that is that after doing business in Slavic Village at this location adjacent to the Mound School site for over 47 years, Morbido is planning to, to uh, close its operations within the next two years. So as you can see, uh, based on the, um, the image that's in front of you, all of the purple there is the Morbido site. And the light blue portion is where the Mound School site is. So they, so Morbido controls much of the land uh, in, in that vicinity. So their goal is to incorporate the Mound School site into their holdings there, and to, which would ensure that the property is left in an optimal position for another business to invest and come in and establish itself and, and retain jobs in the area. And uh, so for us uh, at the city, this type of land assemb assembly is consistent to other prior year goals that the city has exercised to incite future development. And examples of that would include Upper Chester and Opportunity Corridor. And in both of those examples, uh, multiple partners control aggregated land holdings and partner to spur uh, the development that took place. So I'm going to um, uh, ask Chris Alvarado, if he can um, uh, speak to sort of what the goal is, uh, more about the goal and their partnership arrangement and, and Slavic Village role uh, with Morbido uh, to, to carry this out and how they would also maintain the property. Chris? Certainly. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Green. So, uh, as uh, the Commissioner said, we have been working with uh, Mr. Morbido and his team. Uh, we've also been in uh, consultation with Councilman Brancatelli, who is in support of this project. The goal here, and much much of this uh, much of this uh, development site, uh, lies within a uh, semi-industry uh, zoning district. Uh, the goal here is to uh, basically support uh, the uh, industry uh, industry without uh, throughout the uh, the city of Cleveland. And to move this site uh, from its current use as a uh, as a bulk storage and uh, uh, movement facility to one that uh, uses incorporates uh, covered warehouses, uh, being able to uh, uh, provide uh, that kind of quick access to I seventy seven by okay. East Forty Ninth Street. Yes, sorry. I'm sorry. Was there someone speaking? Okay, um, you can see at the northern edge of the site, uh, you, we've got the Morgana Run uh, Trail. So currently there is not much of a buffer between uh, the trail and the, uh, the bulk storage uh, to the south. So part of our work with uh, Mr. Morbido uh, has included uh, the incorporation of uh, uh, buffering between the, uh, the trail and uh, future development on uh, the site. Our understanding is that he has been working with uh, both the broker and may have a uh, uh, potential uh, potential buyer down the road. Mr. Members. I, I move to approve. I second. Motion and second, further discussion. Michael? Bowen. Yes. Downing. Downing. Yes. Hooker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Gray Scott. Yes. Hall. Yes. 
Good luck. Great project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ordinance number 945-2021, authorizing the Director of Community Development to enter into a purchase agreement with the Near West Side Multi-Service Corporation, uh, also known as May Dugan Center, relating to the sale and the use of property which is no longer needed for the city's public use. And to deter determine lease that with May uh, Dugan Center. Who's here for this one? Yes, good morning. This is uh, Director Wackers with Community Development. Good morning. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. So, this, uh, the Near West Side Multi Service Center, also known as May Dugan Center, uh, has existed in um, uh, uh, at uh, 4115 Bridge Avenue for nearly 50 years. Uh, it was funded through a HUD grant uh, that required the city of Cleveland to be the, the applicant, um, but the intention was always to uh, acquire and construct a health services center in the near west side, um, which became the May Dugan Center. Uh, May Dugan currently leases the building um, and has leased the building for the past 50 years, um, and they are responsible for all the, the repair and maintenance and, and capital improvements uh, for that building. And since the building is 50 years, they are undertaking a capital uh, improvement campaign uh, and have secured 1 million in new market tax credits for their project. Uh, the challenge for the city, uh, and we want to be supportive, is that we cannot uh, have a mortgage on city property since we own this site. Um, and we have a, a good tenant uh, with May Dugan Center, uh, and they wish to not use the site for anything other than a health services and, and community services uh, facility. Uh, we think it best that we actually uh, transfer it uh, with a deed restriction that it uh, be restricted to that use um, uh, in perpetuity uh, and so that they can access uh, the million in new market tax credits. Um, and ultimately, the city is, uh, was really a pass through for federal funding in order for the May Dugan to establish their facility. So this is a request um, to authorize that, that sale in essence. Um, we are uh, have an appraisal on the property at uh, $580,000. Uh, they are, uh, we're looking to receive uh, in kind services in that amount over the next five years in order to offset the purchase price. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that the commission may have. Commission members? I move to approve. I second. I'll second. We have a motion and two seconds. Further discussion? Michael Calderol? Owen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Trey Scott. Yes. Paul. Yes. Uh, good luck. Hey, thank you. Resolution number 947 2021, declaring the intent to vacate all of Gladys Road uh, or Avenue. Uh, extending from the east line of East 45th Street and to the west line of East 47th Street. Rick, are you here? Uh, yes, I am. Good morning, everyone. Um, CHN Housing Partners, formerly known as Cleveland Housing Network, requested vacation in Gladys Avenue to best uh, accommodate the uh, new 50-unit supportive housing development referred to as Cuyahoga T-A-Y, which means transition-aged youth. This development will serve an important need by providing supportive housing with services dedicated to needs of youth and young adults ages 18 to 24 who are experiencing homelessness. Of approval, Downing. McCray Scott, a second. A motion and second, further discussion? Michael? Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. I abstain. Curry. Yes. McCray Scott. Yes. Paul. Yes. Motion carries. Administrative approvals. Please take a look and Thank I'll you. take a motion. Thank you, Rick. 
And, I, and I'll take a motion when you're writing. I'll move approval, Downing. Second, Fluker. Motion and second. Uh, further discussion? Michael, call the roll. Owen. Yes. Downing. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Hurry. Yes. Trey Scott. Yes. Paul. Yes. Motion carries. All right, we have a special presentation on form based code updates. Uh, and this is for informational use on, uh, purposes only. Um, who's going to start this off? Yes, good uh, morning, commission members. Um, joining can I, me to. Um, Freddie, sorry, just to say up front, I'd like, even though I think I can remain and discuss this, um, that the Cleveland Foundation provided some early support for the planning for this um, to the city. Um, I think I can still stay and listen because there's no vote, but I just want to make sure in, that the rest of the commission is okay with that. Um, so just want to just check if that's okay. I'm fine with it. Anyone have any descending thoughts about that? I think we're fine, Lillian. Go ahead, Freddie. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you for that disclosure. Um, this uh, initiative has uh, been going on for a couple of years with the update of our zoning code. Um, I do want to provide some context uh, for this. We wanted to bring this to the planning commission. Uh, we will be sharing with, with the city council. And the goal is to acclimate everyone uh, with respect to what the intent of the uh, new form based code is. Uh, also get a better understanding of what it is not and um, also uh, help people to uh, get uh, familiar with some of the character districts and other things that will be introduced as part of this new code. Uh, we will be looking to adopt this uh, early next year, um, but we wanted to make sure that the planning commission as well as council and other uh, individuals who would be touching this new uh, code have some familiarity. And uh, joining me today is uh, Lee Einsweiler and uh, Colin Scarf uh, from Code Studio out of, out of Austin, Texas. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we all know on um, the importance of why we initiated this uh, from a planning commission perspective. Our zoning code uh, has been established since 1929. We do know that the world has changed significantly. We, we also know that much of it is back to the future. Um, many of the neighborhoods that are thriving in the 21st century are walkable, higher density uh, neighborhoods. Um, they are also neighborhoods that really uh, create economic development uh, opportunities. And we also want to make sure that on the uh, procedural side that we are able to modernize our code and really create an opportunity uh, to make our code uh, more predictable and meet some very key principles. And if those uh, things are not regulated, um, we can expect for those outcomes to just happen independently. We initiated this uh, on a pilot basis, targeting several uh, areas of the city of Cleveland that include the Detroit Shoreway area, the Huff uh, area, and the Opportunity Corridor area. Our goal has been and always have been with any of the code changes that have been brought forth we have been very transparent and engaging to the community, and you'll see evidence of that in the presentation. Next slide, please. Um, these are the G three geographies. The reason why we selected these three geographies because they were very different um, with respect to their maturation of development. Uh, obviously, Detroit Shoreway is an area that is uh, very much uh, built out, um, and the Opportunity Corridor, for example, um, which has uh, a ton of vacant land, there's an opportunity there to really reestablish a different type of context. Um, and then there's the uh, section of Huff um, that is highlighted. Each one of these geographies represent the variation of neighborhood uh, typologies in the city of Cleveland in general. Next slide, please. 
Now, one of the key principles uh, behind this, and uh, we can talk further about this, you'll see um, in the code is really about equity. And uh, many of us know traditionally uh, when we do land use planning in neighborhoods that land use planning is just uh, gives general direction, but there's no teeth to land use planning. Uh, the zoning code in partnership with land use planning uh, really creates the opportunity to make sure that the community's voice is not only heard, but codified. And you'll see that as evidence in some of the character mapping that precipitates the establishment of a actual form based code. Next slide. The other principle that is very important to the city of Cleveland and our community is health. Um, making sure that from a health perspective that one can leave out of their front door and be able to walk to amenities. This is often established by districts where you have multiple uses and the right built form. The reason why that's so critical is because we know that from an environmental standpoint as well, the less people have to get in a car and turn a key to be able to get to destinations, the more efficient and low stress that environment is. So form-based zoning actually contributes to the health of a community by creating these types of environments and doing that in a way that is intentional. And you can see in the illustration uh, down there, the types of environments that form-based zoning often creates, particularly along commercial corridors. Next slide, please. And also, uh, you know, sustainability, uh, making sure that we have a code that creates the conditions for uh, enhanced environmental uh, features, adequate pedestrian spaces, and things of that nature. Uh, these are gonna be very important principles as we move forward uh, and as we get development proposals in front of us. Um, and having a code that uh, creates that expectation and really makes it more predictable is something that we're looking to achieve. Next slide. And uh, from a process standpoint uh, and from a commission standpoint, predictability is key uh, with respect to development interests, knowing what to expect um, when they actually come to the table and having those expectations clearly defined, clearly articulated and very illustrative. Um, the form based code will have illustrations, which you'll see that makes the code digestible. Our goal is to ensure that individuals in the community, as well as practitioners can easily read and understand, uh, our, our zoning code. And as you'll see in the illustrations, um, during the discussion, uh, you'll notice the, um, the, uh, clarity, um, in which the form based uh, code, uh, articulates. I'm gonna turn it over to Lee Einsweiler, who's going to really walk you through the meat of what the uh, code is, is stating, and then we can uh, move further into the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Director Collier. Uh, can everybody hear me just fine? Great. Um, so first and foremost, I uh, wanna point out that uh, the city of Cleveland actually has a number of form-based elements. It's Detroit Shoreway in our project area is that boundary there, but you'll see the, the blue on the map. That's the urban form overlay. It's got its own urban frontage line. Uh, uh, the green on the map is the pedestrian retail overlay sitting to the east of that, and that's got its own frontage line. So you're using a lot of the form based tools already uh, in what you're doing. Next slide. Wow. So one of the keys here to what we're trying to do is get the building in the right place on the site. If we're trying to get you to walk down the street, we want that building up close to you. If we're trying to get you to shop in the shop or dine at the restaurant. We want you to be seeing that and not just the parking lot for it. Next slide, please. When that building placement is done incorrectly, uh, then you have wasted efforts like this beautiful streetscape uh, that doesn't generate any money for that leather goods store in the background. Uh, um, and by the way, that's not in Cleveland. So uh, what about the that. financials? You got uh, next slide. 
Parking location is another critical element. Uh, I know you guys were just talking about some townhouses today. So, you know, here's what townhouses in lots of parts of the US look like. Uh, and uh, you can't uh, ride your bike on the sidewalk around the street. So you're not going to send your kids out to play and actually uh, having your front door be just a little hidey hole next to a giant garage door is not the most aesthetic setting. Next slide. Typically, the same urban form can be produced in a different manner, and this is just simply by providing rear access. In this specific case, it's a historic property, um, uh, but uh, it's an example of what making sure that the form uh, is regulated uh, produces. Next slide, please. One of the other elements that form-based codes are very interested in is height. But uh, if you regulate height only in feet, you will uh, often get the exact same height throughout. So those of you who've visited the heart of Paris or the heart of DC uh, have seen that sort of uh, battleship frontage that gets created by having a uniform height. So regulating height in feet and stories allows you to get a little bit more interest uh, in your buildings. Not all builders will build the tall, tall floors that you might see on that uh, red building in the background. Uh, in fact, the same number of stories are in the one uh, with the green roof, although the top story is a half story. Next slide, please. The main thing about height is what it signals to its neighbors. So this particular new building is signaling to this single family house that it should be demolished and a new building should be put up in its place. Uh, there are no windows facing it. Um, uh, it is uh, massive. It doesn't attempt to step away from the adjacent building at all. So uh, this issue of transitions and how building height manages those transitions is also important and regulated in typical form-based codes. Next slide. Windows and doors, this should not be hard. We shouldn't have to ask people for these, but frankly, if we don't code for it, um, uh, we get bad results. Next slide. Again, uh, not in Cleveland, so don't feel bad. Um, but this kind of stuff happens all the time. It's easy to put your parking behind a podium and just you know, block everybody off from the street. Um, and uh, it's not the best outcome for the community. That's not a comfortable place to walk. If they weren't working on that building, I don't suppose those guys would be on that side of the street. Next slide, please. Use is another issue that's regulated in form-based code. Uh, there is a little spin on that, which is often we're regulating use in a vertical manner. Typically, we think of use as a horizontal thing, this next to that. Um, uh, but in this case, we are now talking about what kinds of uses you can have on the ground floor versus what kinds of uses you might be able to have in the upper stories of the building. Next slide. Streets and streetscapes can be part of a form-based code. In this particular instance, uh, we are uh, hoping to regulate streetscape uh, and at least take into account the back of the curb uh, portion of things so that uh, as new projects come through, we can widen sidewalks, uh, potentially put in stormwater improvements in those uh, uh, tree lawn areas, get new trees planted, and make sure that Cleveland streets continue to look great. Next slide, please. The final component I wanted to mention, and Freddie mentioned it earlier, is gathering space and especially publicly accessible gathering space. So you can see this, this courtyard being pulled in off the sidewalk, uh, providing an opportunity for people to linger, um, uh, and yet still a great sidewalk and cars and transportation and all those elements that we want uh, all coming together. But if we don't require it, and especially if we don't require it on the ground floor and in the front, uh, we probably won't get it that way. Next slide, please. This project started uh, by uh, selecting those, those uh, areas that we uh, looked at to make sure that we had patterns of a variety of different places. Um, for those of you who followed the project early on, you may remember that we actually expanded this project area. Councilman Zone was in place at that point in time and uh, was very interested in catching the neighborhoods in the uh, in the 80s and 90s there uh, in this project area. Um, so we included those and they turned out to be an important part of the discussion. So uh, that, was, that was a wise decision on his part. Next slide, please. 
while we were engaged in looking at this area, we came to town pre-COVID and uh, ran a week-long exercise with a lot of support from the community and uh, from the planning department. Um, uh, we had a, a public bike tour, which was uh, amazing because there's nothing better than seeing Cleveland on a bike. It got us down to the waterfront uh, from this project area, which we probably wouldn't have done if we were just on foot. Um, we did a hands-on workshop that evening with the whole community. We ran an open design studio right there in uh, the Detroit Shoreway project area. Um, we had experts along uh, with us on transportation and, and our own team on form-based coding. So we shared that uh, with the community at two lunch and learns over the course of the next couple of days. We had our first feedback loop in the midweek with an open house where we made sure that we were understanding what we heard from the community and projecting that back to them as we began our work. We continued uh, with the open design studio, closed it on Friday morning to make sure we could get our presentation ready for that evening and presented uh, on Friday evening. Um, that presentation is uh, available on the website if anybody wants to go look for it. Uh, it was uh, extremely well received, we felt. Um, uh, so it was a was a great opportunity to to actually be in and working in the community hands on. I'm going to contrast that with a little what we did later in the project. But here's some imagery from that uh, on the bottom left. There is where we ran the studio uh, space um, right there, uh, uh, and uh, a lot of things going on. A lot of commenting. A lot of people pointing at maps, and uh, uh, it's just the way you'd want it to be. Um, next slide, please. So what came out of that experience was what we call character areas, not quite zoning yet, but almost. Um, I'm going to show you some of those character areas in general on the next image. But um, uh, here what you're seeing is that it kind of the, the, the main location uh, uh, was at Detroit and Lake there, uh, where uh, at the time there was a, a Burger King and a gas station and not a whole lot of other things. So that's kind of the epicenter of this portion of the community. Uh, but there's potential for a second one uh, right there before the bridge as you go up towards the park uh, where the pub is uh, there. Um, and there's great opportunity where you see those dashed streets in the north where that um, industrial area is converting. Battery Park is uh, not terribly far east of here, so I'm sure people can envision what could happen in a place like this. There's a lot of art uh, activity in there now today. There's still some industrial activity. So how to pull that together as, as part of the community was a continuing part of that discussion. Next slide, please. What we prepared then were these uh, 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 character areas. This one's the residential portion of the community, the furthest west. And in our conversations with the community, there was a willingness to talk about additional uh, units on the lots here. Many of these have duplex units or other older uh, uh, multiplex uh, projects um, on the lots already. Um, so there was an interest in uh, being able to have both the combination of uh, smaller units, perhaps in the backyard, uh, the ability to break a unit out of the main house if you needed to, and just find ways to uh, produce more income for the existing property owners but also for them to accommodate their lifestyle, whether it's multi-generational family, uh, whether it's um, uh, kids returning home, uh, all those kinds of things are, are a, a challenge for many homeowners today. Um, so uh, we came up with a height of two and a half stories and a general parking standard at the time of, of one per unit. Next slide. This is just some imagery that we shared with people to kind of talk about what these places might look like. Uh, and especially about what additional new development might look like. It's really important to debunk the myth that uh, contemporary architecture is not for regular neighborhoods. Um, so we intentionally included imagery in our conversations to make certain we were having a conversation about whether they were comfortable with more contemporary architecture. And in fact, in most instances, if it was well designed, uh, we felt that 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 was a non-issue. Next slide, please. I want to contrast that residential area with this residential mixed use concept uh, that we came up with. So this is an area around an existing park uh, and it's a little more intense already. We allowed for increased height, but we also allowed for live work, 
uh, for the reactivation of embedded commercial structures that were in that project area today, uh, and, and generally allowed for modest uh, intensity uh, mixed use in this area, tapering up uh, in intensity as you get towards the key corridors of Detroit and Lake. Next slide. One of the things about that uh, mixed use concept is uh, it could be in an existing house, as you see in the top left there. Uh, it could be allowing an artist studio. It could be a home recording studio. It could be a coffee shop all the way up the spectrum from sort of personal and private kinds of things uh, on up to uh, include uh, uh, public facing uh, small retail activity. Next slide. Here's a great example, this uh, yellow building uh, with its, its uh, pasted on front. You'll see the house back behind there still uh, in many older cities. This happened you know, during the 20s, 30s, and 40s as people uh, in the interest of uh, uh, hanging on to their property or improving their property uh, built their own little businesses out front and uh, ran those to the benefit of their immediate neighbors. Next slide, please. So, in addition to that uh, charrette experience that we had, um, we worked also in the opportunity corridor on innovation square and the new economy uh, uh, character area uh, that is seen here. Um, this area, we did not spend as much time uh, uh, out in the community and having that community conversation, although we were involved with the CDCs that are involved in the area. Because there has been so much planning done, and in fact, very, very detailed planning done for these areas. So, in essence, we were coding for these pieces uh, of the opportunity corridor. You see some of the plans there on the on the right hand side. Next slide. Uh, this portion, this portion, the core job zone was a really interesting piece. We ended up with a very uh, challenging discussion about. The corridor running through here uh, versus the kinds of, of larger scale, large footprint businesses that would be back behind that corridor. Uh, again, um, uh, led by the corridor study that had been done on 79th Street there and uh, the activity that was already beginning to take place uh, in the surrounding area. Next slide, please. When we got to Huff, the conversation was quite different. As we began to move forward in Huff, um, we had uh, kind of a double whammy. Um, we were all sent home, uh, so we weren't going to be able to come work with the community in the way that we would prefer, um, uh, in sort of a hands-on way, uh, but rather uh, uh, we had to figure out a way to work uh, long distance. And Huff was an especially engaged neighborhood. Uh, the CDCs were also involved, uh, so that was very impressive. Um, and I want to turn the next two slides over to uh, Daniel Gray Cantar, who actually led some of our early activity to try to get this neighborhood's uh, ideas embedded in the new form based code. Thanks so much, Lee. Uh, so, uh, based on some work that um, Lexi Lattimore, who is a, a dance artist and performer, and also uh, was a student at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, we had done some work together on another project uh, along East 66th Street for the redesign of that street. And our purpose um, in that project was uh, some community empowerment and engagement. Um, and we, we did a lot of this work um, in the digital domain via Zoom uh, because we had to really pivot um, when the pandemic hit and identifying the best ways to interface with neighbors in Huff who would have some uh, input in the redesign of East 66th Street. So off of that work, uh, we were also able to work with uh, Lee Code Studio and with, uh, with Freddie and several others on this project. Uh, next slide, please. So our community empowerment um, efforts really were in in about three different phases. Um, and you'll see here, there are about 16 meetings that took place between um, October uh, and May. Uh, and so the first phase really was about um, educating the community about some key concepts. Uh, the first was um, the history and legacy of redlining and its impact on the city and particularly on Huff. 
I was also educating neighbors about um, zoning. And then it was about educating neighbors about what form-based zoning could look like in the neighborhood. Once we were able to engage in, in those education efforts, we were able to shift into um, understanding some of those key concepts that Lee expressed a little earlier, but then marrying those key concepts with the key themes that the neighbors wanted to see in the neighborhood and the value, the values of the neighborhood. Marrying those two efforts uh, took a significant portion of the meetings that you see there. Uh, but the end result was the creation of a working board um, who was comprised of about nine folks. And their charge was to, in fact, uh, learn more about how to marry these concepts together and to ultimately come up with the character map uh, with Lee and Colin and the rest of the team. I want to say, uh, lastly, that uh, this process was truly empowering. Uh, for the neighbors, um, it was an opportunity for the neighbors to to think um, as city planners, um, and that is truly invaluable. And uh, also for them to be a part of the co-creation of what their neighborhood should and could look like. Uh, so with that, um, I'll pass it back to Lee. Thanks, Daniel. That was excellent. I appreciate it. Next slide, please. Uh, along with the work that Daniel was doing, we also posted an interactive map and uh, it was populated in part by uh, uh, on the ground survey teams that went out and uh, talked with people on the street. But this was basically a, a, a chance for people to point out where there were challenges in the neighborhood today, where there were good things they liked, uh, things they didn't like. Um, uh, and you'll see we got uh, responses from, from fairly much throughout the neighborhood. And those really helped us, uh, they helped influence the mapping, they led to better discussions uh, uh, with the working group. I will say uh, uh, the working group that Daniel led, the, the conversation was fairly deep. Uh, it is still part of healing the wounds this neighborhood feels from the 1960s and, and before. Um, it was, um, it was a model for us to begin to hope to replicate in other of our projects. And so I'm, I'm grateful to have worked on. Next slide. So as we began to talk about Huff, we got down to the point where we could actually produce a zoning map. And one of the keys to the zoning map for Huff is that the Huff corridor, uh, they would like to see reactivated. And they'd also be willing to allow some different kinds of activity along uh, uh, Chester uh, on the south side as well. So um, uh, between those and the corridor work that had been done already involving um, uh, uh, the ballpark and the location where the new library will be, um, there's lots of change coming. As many of you may know, uh, the MLK school site is uh, up on the, on the market right this minute and available. So there's a negotiation going on about that. So there will be some, some key things happening in this neighborhood that um, uh, we are hoping that the uh, community will remain engaged uh, and, and stay focused on. Um, so um, uh, next slide, please. The draft of the form based code uh, has been pulled together. Um, uh, staff is, is working their way through many of the issues. We're uh, happy to share it um, uh, internally if, if people are interested. Um, uh, it's not quite ready for adoption, but it will be coming soon. Um, but I wanted to point out that basically it is a, uh, it is a parallel code, but not a complete code. So it, it stands alone. Um, uh, we have made it uh, Title Seven A instead of Title Seven, um, uh, but it has many of the components that you would find in the remainder of the code. So it does have zoning districts, it does have use regulations, it does have development standards. It's going to have its own uh, particular administration for the review of development within the area, uh, and so 
uh, it, it has many of those kinds of things that you would expect um, uh, in, in uh, the zoning code itself. However, in this particular case, they are, we hope, more elegantly laid out, uh, a little bit clearer, um, and uh, also illustrated. Next to me, please. So just as an example, um, one of the districts that's uh, uh, showing up in, in Huff, we're calling House 4. That means uh, four units on a lot uh, in fundamentally a house form. Uh, next slide, please. So the content for that looks like this. It is, it is summarized on this set of three pages. There are lots more rules that sit behind this, but fundamentally the, the, the uh, nitty gritty of what you need to get to figure out what you can put on your site, uh, at, either as a developer or as a homeowner, is right here on these three pages. And so uh, uh, we have the rules for the site on the first page on the left, the rules that and that's kind of 2D, two dimensional flat stuff. And then on the right are the sites for the building. When you go three dimensional, you know, what happens there? And that begins with the massing that's on the left hand column there. And on the right hand column there, you see the full uh, articulation kinds of things like windows and doors. Finally, we've we've vastly compressed your use table. We have a single page use table. We think we can manage for all of these areas so far. Um, and uh, so instead of pages and pages and pages of every listed use under the universe, far broader categories, relying on the form of development um, and uh, uh, the, the maintenance of bulk and mass and the placement of the building and all of those kinds of elements, far more than we are relying on whether you are a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker. Next slide. So the house four could generate any of these kinds of things. So one of the things that you could do is carve something out of your existing house, like the bottom on the ground floor, like uh, finishing an attic that was never finished. You could attach a new unit on the back of your house. You could stack a unit above your existing garage. You could build a new detached unit in the backyard. You could convert the garage itself into a unit. Uh, you could create a duplex out of the house with totally separate entrances uh, and no connection, maybe a triplex, maybe even a quadplex. You could build new something like two duplexes on the site or potentially four small bungalows, uh, especially uh, important in this day of, of aging uh, as we're looking for those ground floor kinds of units. So these are all examples of what could be built under the code uh, in, in those neighborhoods that were designated. Next slide, please. I wanna show you another example. This is urban node three, that means three stories tall. And the urban node part is the notion that we are trying to create um, some particular places to focus and concentration of, of commercial activity both uh, uh, up and down uh, uh, and uh, east-west. So uh, that's Huff, you'll see with, with the urban node located along it at um, it key particular places, um, but not everywhere. One of the points is we don't have enough retail activity to designate these enormous corridors from one end to the other uh, and, and fill them with retail activity. Next slide. So we want to concentrate that activity into fairly intense buildings in these node locations and the intensity tapers off as you move away from them. Again, this is just the district pages showing you uh, uh, what's going on uh, inside those districts. The same three pages as you would be looking at for a residential district uh, fit here for the urban node district. Next slide, please. These are just some images of what that urban node district might generate. Um, again, a, a little bit of a focus on contemporary architecture to make sure that we're making the point that uh, not everything needs to emulate the 1940s you know, era of, of the neighborhood as originally built. Next slide, please. So we worked through in all of these and actually built not the just the character districts and the character map that you saw originally from Detroit Shoreway, but an actual uh, formal uh, zoning map for the area. So this is the zoning map for Detroit Shoreway. Next slide. For Opportunity Corridor, 
uh, specifically for Innovation Square. Next slide. For the remaining piece of the Opportunity Corridor, the core job zone. So all of those uh, pieces uh, exist. We've made our uh, recommendations. We have our draft pulled together. Uh, We're working through the draft. Um, next slide, please. Uh, first and foremost, with uh, the law department, they've begun their review. Um, we intend to complete that review with them this year and make revisions as necessary. We're going to give this same introductory presentation to the Council's uh, Development Planning and Sustainability Committee uh, sometime in the near future. Uh, we will be doing an introductory presentation of their particular code in each of the three pilot areas, Detroit Charway Huff and the Opportunity Corridor. We are hoping for adoption in early 2022. That's our presentation. Oh, one more point. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the project website, if you wanted to look, is thelandcode.com. Don't forget the the. So thelandcode.com is the project's website and uh, where you can keep track of what's going on with things and where we'll be posting the drafts as we move forward. Thank you very much. Commission members? Yeah, I'd just like to commend um, Freddie and his staff and and all who was in who were involved. This is this is huge. This is very huge. I mean, I'm I was in a meeting yesterday um at for the CDCLP cohort, and we were talking about this, right? We we're talking about the the challenges of overcoming redlining, the challenges of overcoming inadequate and and halfway half baked solutions. Um but this is this is great. So kudos to everyone. Thank you. Anyone else? I just like to say it's a fabulous job and uh, I think you uh, articulated your ideas very well in this presentation. So thanks a lot. Thank you for that. Hey, Mr. Chair, right. I just want to say really quickly because we're not taking a vote. Um, yep. uh, the emphasis on the law department review and the desired adoption, uh, which would take place. Uh, we will be establishing an internal team to actually review projects as they come through under this code um, in these specific project areas. Uh, because again, our job and goal here is to determine the efficacy of this. Um, to make sure that it's meeting the objectives that we want it to meet. And if we are satisfied uh, that it has done so, uh, our desire will be to scale this up citywide. And as you know, we're gonna be updating our comprehensive plan for the city of Cleveland. And looking at the nexus of land use and zoning, this is that marriage. So being able to codify community interest is the real innovation here. Um, that's something that typically is done in two separate buckets. Um, and the latter may in some cases not happen. So we believe uh, to your point, Mr. Fluker, that you know this is a, a, a pivot point. Um, and you know, there are individuals who um, uh, may not agree totally um, with this, but we've combed through this pretty well. And when we talk about health, equity, and sustainability and trying to right the wrongs of the past. Um, this is a tool we believe that gets us there more so than anything I've seen um, in the last uh, 20 years since I've been in this profession. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to design review, Southeast design review. Uh, this is Woodhill Center East, new construction seeking final approval. 11305 Woodland Avenue. Uh, who's here for this? Um, you have Alex Pesto with City Architecture. Anyone else join you, Alex? Um, I believe Matt Schmidt from CMHA and Megan Capel from the Community Builders are also on the call. Okay, so if you can all raise your right hand, uh, do you sign my story to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I must recuse myself. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, August. 
Okay, Alex, go ahead. All right, sure. No, thank you. And and this is, I appreciate you guys making time for us. This is the second time I think that you guys have seen this. So we are back for uh, final approval. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go through pretty quickly. And just again, we have Megan and Matt also on the line. Should there be questions? Um, I think, Michael, you're in control. If you could just flip through the slides and I'll kind of give an overview as you do that. I don't want to belabor. Um, but just, an, just a reminder that uh, the Woodhill project is, is really encompassing of Buckeye Woodhill. We had a fantastic groundbreaking event uh, last week where we had Senator Sherrod Brown and, and Madam Secretary Marsha Fudge in town. It was quite the event uh, on our phase one. And so with the project today is phase two, if you can just keep flipping, uh, Michael, that'll be fine. Um, and just kind of keep going through all this stuff, just kind of, it is a comprehensive plan um, and these first implementation kind of strategies are these phases that are coming out of the plan. Um, we we're excited to get shovels into the ground as soon as possible. Um, usually you got, this board knows that plans take a long time to implement and this is uh, a very quick kind of turnaround time. Uh, it is a testament to CMHA and also TCB's commitment to getting this work done uh, in partnership with Director Collier, uh, the planning department and others uh, through the community development and economic development um, kind of factions of City Hall as well. So we can keep going and we'll get specific to uh, this site. This is all context um, of just kind of how comprehensive the plan is. It's over 600 units uh, that will be kind of built as part of new construction. Uh, as part of, of part of this work. So um, if we could pause at the next slide, I think that would be fantastic. Um, the reason why I'm here today is to get final approval on the site that's outlined in orange on the right-hand side uh, of the screen. So just kind of as a quick uh, kind of uh, review, phase one, which is down in the bottom left of this map, that's where we were last week for the groundbreaking. Uh, that's right across the street from uh, the RTA uh, 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 rapid station that's there. Phase two, which is uh, further up Woodland towards uh, East 116th MLK. That's why we're here today. And then kind of the heart of the existing Woodhill Estates are future phases, um, phases four through six of this work. All of this is uh, in motion. All of this will get done. Uh, and so I just wanted to make sure that we kind of understand that context. So we can go ahead and flip through uh, the next series. That would be fantastic. Um, our site is here. Uh, Woodland is in the foreground, Mount Carmel, Mount Overlook, and then up on the top right is the Baldwin Water Treatment Facility. Uh, on the left of the slide, oops, on the left of the upper side, um, you can see kind of the existing Woodhill Estates. Um, and East 110th there is the street that, that is kind of the, the edge of uh, the current estates. Um, go to the next one. Uh, current site conditions are, it is, there was a former community garden. Um, we've worked with that group. Um, to see if there is an interest to reposition uh, that type of activity onto the greater context into the neighborhood plan. Um, those conversations are ongoing um, because we do see certain value and this is consistent with what we heard uh, in the neighborhood planning process. So we can keep moving. Um, this particular uh, phase consists of really two types of development uh, on the right hand side in the gray is a um, multifamily building. Uh, 60 units into that building and on the left hand side there um, are a series of 17 townhomes we park uh, behind um, we wanted to kind of have uh, the least amount of, of ingress uh, and egress onto Woodland Avenue um, and this was really well supported by the uh, design review committee that we've gone through um, kind of two iterations with them um, some of the comments we can kind of start flipping through some of the comments that we heard there we're primarily around the site development and where play structures and where open space and kind of how we're dealing with stormwater. Uh, the site is well lit with building lighting and also parking lot lighting and keep moving through. Um, a, a really robust landscaping plan and kind of keep going through there. Um, you guys have seen most of this stuff before and then the townhomes are interesting. Keep going, we'll get to the townhomes landscape plan. Uh, we were asked by, oops, sorry, can you go back one? We were asked by the design review to look at this lot, which is not currently owned or controlled by the development team. They are in active conversations to do so, but instead of leaving it blank, we were asked to 
uh, kind of see how that space would be utilized. If we can go to the next slide now, that'd be fantastic. And it would be incorporating um, a little bit larger uh, play area uh, and some landscaping into that space should it become available in part of the development plan, which again is, is kind of the intent moving forward. Um, we were asked specifically around dumpster surrounds, which I know is extremely exciting uh, for this group, but that's what we've kind of responded. That's the next slide with the, uh, with the design review. So um, I think that that kind of takes us to the end. Um, if you want to kind of flip through, but appreciative of the time, um, very excited to be back and talk about the specific initiatives that are spinning pretty quickly out of and resulting from that, that plan planning work that was done over the course of three and a half, four years. Um, if we could end on the rendering, I think that that's all I've got to say. Um, I don't know if Matt, uh, from CMHA or Megan from TCB would like to close us out, but thank you to this chair. Um, thank you to the commission. I'm looking forward to hearing your comments. Alex, great job, by the way. Thank you. Appreciate that. Anyone else from the development team? This is Any Megan um, from TCB. Uh, I think Alex did a great job covering it, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. I move approval. Um, and I just want to say that um, just the collaborative nature of which this project has gotten done and it's just extraordinary. So thank you. And um, I would also note just Alex, you and your teams uh, more than the designers on this project have been advocates in a really important way too. So thank you. Thank you, Lillian. That means a lot. Really appreciate that. I'll second downing. We have a motion and second further discussion. I just like to say uh, it's, it's, a great project or great projects and since it's in phases uh, in the earlier part of my life, we lived at Woodhill family estate. So it's great to see. You know, this coming forward. So. Michael, call the roll. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Please abstain. Hurry. Yes. Craig Scott. Yes. Paul. Yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you. Have a great day. Cedar Cedar Avenue mixed use new construction. This is for schematic approval. Who's here for this? Good morning. This is Aaron Hill, architect with Bylaski Cleveland. Mr. Chairman, just, properties. just wanted to point out that uh, Stami has, uh, is going to be checking out soon. Okay, we're going to keep on forging forward. We still have a quorum. Mr. Chair, I'm going to recuse myself. Okay, uh, Aaron, I'm going to have to swear you in. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury? I do. Go ahead. Okay, before I walk you through the design, I want to let uh, Adam Fishman with the developer of Fairmont Properties just quickly introduce the project. Hey, Adam. Mr. Chairman, good to see you. Um, nice and you. Uh, uh, good to see members of the commission. Look forward to seeing you all in person. It's nice to see so many friendly names that I've known for so many years. Um, this is a really um, important milestone for us to reach this point. This is a um, a, a mixed use project that we've been working on for a long time with the tremendous support of uh, the Cleveland Clinic, Fairfax Renaissance Development Corporation, uh, Councilman Griffin, uh, and the Meyer Corporation that's going to bring a 40,000 square foot grocery store uh, Sorry, into uh, it. Um, I forgot, um, the foundation actually has a loan into this project, so I'm going to abstain as well. So I apologize. I don't know if you have a quorum, but I should just make sure you do. David, will I they think have we a still have a quorum. Yeah, that's correct, okay. Mr. Chairman. Then we should move fast before Stammy steps off. Yeah. <laughs> then Aaron, I'll turn it over to you. Go ahead, Aaron, go quickly. Okay, thank you, I will. Um, to let the commission know where we stand in the process, we just completed schematic design four weeks ago are now in our develop design development phase and thus seeking any feedback from the commission as we advance the project, uh, looking to complete construction documents at the beginning of next year. So on this context plan, uh, you can see our project is located in the Fairfax neighborhood along the southern edge of the Cleveland Clinic campus. 
on the opportunity corridor. Next, please. Our site is 2.9 acres at that southwest corner of Cedar Avenue and East 105th Street, which is in a limited retail business zoning district. Next. Some aerial views here of the site, just showing the scale of the Fairfax residential neighborhood to the southwest of the site with the larger scaled institutional buildings of the clinic to the north and east of the site. Next. Bit of site context here as viewed from the ground level, starting with number one in the upper left. Directly north of the site, we have a large parking lot, utility enclosure, and the four story clinic pathology lab off in the distance. Below that, looking northwest, we have the large six story parking deck. Looking directly to our west, we have the three story clinic cardiovascular center. Back to the top of page left right at a corner to our site we have the new eight-story parking garage for the clinic and directly east of our site is the new two-story ibm building so these immediate surroundings are all large-scale institutional commercial buildings next just have a survey here for reference if needed we can next this is a massing diagram of the project program we have a 40,000 square foot ground floor retail space, which is for a store. Sitting on that retail podium, we have five stories of apartments for a total of 190 units in 150,000 square feet. In the background, you can see there the adjacent three story parking garage with 200 spaces for the residential units and 105 surface level spaces dedicated to the grocer. This is how that program lays down on the site. We've sited the building adjacent to Cedar Avenue, parking lot and the garage to the south on Frank Avenue. There is one single entrance for the grocery store, which occurs on the southeast corner, making it clearly visible from East 105th while being convenient to the adjacent parking lot, as well as those that are walking in from the Fairfax neighborhood. We have two residential lobbies, one on the northwest corner on Cedar, which is geared towards the clinic employees walking to and from campus. A second residential lobby to the south that is directly adjacent to the parking garage for the residents. All of our loading and service for both the grocer and the residential units is off of East 103rd Street. Um, we've held the building back four feet from the street on East 105th, 20 to 30 feet from Cedar Avenue to allow for a generous landscape buffer, both adjacent to the street and to the building, which I'll show in section in a moment. On the southern half of the site, we have the surface level parking spaces for the grocer surrounded by a landscape buffer. And above the western half of that parking, we have the three story parking garage for the residents. Next. In looking at this building section, starting at the street level, you can see how that 24 foot setback breaks down with a six foot wide landscape buffer along the street, eight foot wide pedestrian walkway, and then eight feet of depth at the building that alternates between landscaping and seating areas. At the building, you can see this 21 foot high podium base we have with five levels of residential above at 11 feet floor to floor uh, that totals a building that's just under 80 feet tall. We felt it was important to pull the housing portion back 15 feet from the podium edge for a couple of reasons. The first being to improve the pedestrian scale so that one would be walking beside a 20 foot high building wall rather than the full 80 feet high of building. And then secondly, this move allows us to create an important distinction between the grocer and the residential, which you'll see more in the renderings. Next. We worked closely with the grocer on the program blocking plan with the goal to create as much transparency into the ground floor as possible. We have full height transparency where we really need it 
looking at the northeast and southeast corners, which are shown in green, and um, the tenant space uh, that is on the northeast corner is likely going to be a coffee shop, which would have seating along roll-up glass doors on that north wall and a walk-up service window on the east wall. For the remainder of the ground floor facade, we have clear story glass that starts at seven feet high, which is shown in orange. In addition to the street activation of the grocer, northwest corner and the midpoint of the southern facade is also activated with full transparency for the residential lobbies. Next. This is just a typical residential floor plan, our typical five floors of 190 units. The podium deck on the interior of that U will be an activated amenity space for the residents. Next. Now we want to describe the design of the building with a series of renderings. This first view is looking southwest from the corner of East 105th and Cedar. The goal is to create a building with a unified language of the retail podium base and the residential portion above while at the same time giving each of those elements a distinct identity. The challenge that our design concept is responding to is creating a language that is both cohesive with the modern institutional aesthetic, the Cleveland Clinic campus that we're directly adjacent to, while at the same time being responsive to the residential scale of the Fairfax neighborhood that we're within. So one of the ways that we create that distinction between the base and the housing above is, as I mentioned before, by stepping the building back 15 feet, which creates a residential terrace and a visual transition between the two components of the building. The building design is recognizing the significance of the East 105th and Cedar Avenue corner with the bold move of the gradient pattern of the facade with a light gray brick slowly dissolves to reveal the gray tone panels at that corner. I also want to note in this rendering and the others you're about to see uh, that the signage is actually the exact proposed signage uh, in name and size. Next. This is a view from the northwest looking east down Cedar. The housing component above is breaking the, the scale of the building down with this pattern of light gray tone brick that dissolves as it gets progressively narrower approaching the building corner. Set back from that brick scaffold is a playful pattern of three materials. Our three foot by six foot casement windows are flanked by three various tones of metal panels. Carefully integrated into those panels, you'll also see the full height, narrow spaced louvers that provide additional texture to the facade, but functionally are serving the stacked VTEC units behind them. In the foreground, you see one of our two residential lobbies with uh, wood grained canopies to provide a bit more warmth to the facade. Now looking at the southeast corner of the building along East 105th Street in the foreground, you'll see the uh, entry to the grocer under the large cantilevered canopy, again with the wood plank on the underside. The base of the building has a regular rhythm of 15 foot bays that help relate to the scale of the pedestrian walking by. The grocer has a brand identity language that they call urban grit which is accomplished through their use of materials of brick, concrete, steel, and reclaimed wood that will make up the interior build out. So we want to utilize those same materials on the facade of their space with substantial materials of brick, steel, and with an understandable language that harkens back to historic warehouse buildings. Next. While this is not a polished rendering, we just wanted to show the complete southern facade so that you can understand both the extent of the glazing on the ground floor and how the residential portion of the facade again dissolves as it turns the corner. This view has the parking garage removed for clarity of the building. We completely understand that the screening and treatment of 
that garage facade is a very important component of the project. Currently working through various approaches and plan to present that as soon as it's ready as a part of our next and final desired use. Next. Just a few details of the podium. Uh, one of the items I want to point out here is the articulation of the brick at the ground level where we are pushing and pulling it to create texture and visual interest in these shadow lines. Next. A couple of detail, oh, one back, yep, thanks. A couple of detail views of the residential portion where on the left, you can see the powder coated aluminum frame to define the residential terraces with the sunshades. And on the right. Hey, 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 Aaron, it's Adam. I'm just gonna interrupt you for a moment, just as a matter of, um, Procedure, Mr. Chairman, I, I, are, are you um, running short on time for a quorum? I don't want to. Um, uh, I don't want to run into a difficulty on um, being able to take action if you're so inclined. Yeah, I haven't gotten a text, and the commission members, if they see enough, they can make a motion right away. So okay, thank you. We can let we can let them go. And I'd also mention, uh, Ms. Curry, uh, as much as we'd love to have the Cleveland Foundation in in this deal, I think the uh, project you're invested in might be just the one just south. Um, uh, with um, um, McCormick Barron, so I, I don't um, just wanted to mention that maybe uh, that affords Ms. Um, um, Curry the opportunity to vote if she's so inclined. Thank you. Okay, are you sure of that thought? Like that we're not also involved in this one. And then uh, I, I asked my entire project team, so I I, I think so. I'm, I'm okay. fairly sure. Well, now you can't look for money from her. Okay, I'm voting no money for you. No, I'm just kidding. Next project, Lily, if you'll still have, if you'll still have us. Um, All right, let's keep on moving, Aaron. Yeah, we have. From anyhow. Okay. Uh, again, not a polished rendering here, but in order to give you a complete picture of the building, this is the west facade. Uh, where you can see the outer portion of the U terminating uh, and becoming entirely. Metal panels on the interior of the U. Uh, also in this view, you can see our loading dock for the grocer carved out of the brick mass. Next. One last perspective view, uh, this being on the internal courtyard of the residential amenity roof deck. You can see here, similar to the outer facing facades, the movement into these corners that we're expressing through the light versus dark metal panels accentuated on these facades with a bit of color in the yellow metal panels. Next. Some photos of the primary facade materials that we're planning for the podium base. We're using a warm gray manganese iron spot brick that's shown on the right. That has a nice sheen to it. A lot of tonal variation of purplish hues in that gray with some flecks of yellow. For the housing brick above, we're planning on a light gray blend that's shown there on the left that has a nice range of three different brick tones ranging from light to darker. For the metal panels, there are also three tones of gray as well as that tightly spaced louver to hide the air intakes of the VTEC units behind. Next. Uh, just some additional materials that would be uh, black window mullions for both the grocer and the residential. As I described before, the phenolic wood look uh, planks in the underside of all the entry canopies. I'll also note that we just finished finalizing the brick blend yesterday for the residential, which is uh, much more interesting than this picture shows. And then the final slide, we wanted to just explain the proposed signage that again is accurately shown in the renderings. We would have four total laid signs two on each street facing facade. We have a wall mounted uh, sign at the corner of East 105th and Cedar above the canopy. And then the main entry sign shown there to the bottom right, which is the freestanding mounted on the scaffold above the canopy. And then finally, that bottom left image represents the two grade mounted monument signs that are marking each of the two parking lot entries. So that's where we currently stand with the project. Appreciate the commission's time and look forward to hearing any of your comments. 
Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so this is for schematic design approval. Uh, commission members, questions? I move approval, Downing. Since I can vote, second, I'll second it. <laughs> All right, okay. Sammy seconded it, she gets it. Okay, so we have a motion and second. Further discussion, any questions, comments? It's kind of dangerous now that you let me talk. So I'm just gonna say one thing. I think when you come back, I, I love the building. I like the design. I actually like the glass as it comes down to the ground. Um, I do think just because of the kind of emerging um, still yet understood way that um, this terminus at Opportunity Quarter on 105 um, is, is gonna look and feel for a pedestrian too, not just for cars. Um, I think as you come into the next phase for me, the kind of articulation truly of what happens between this building front and the street edge. Um, and, you know, kind of really important for these 1st few projects, because it's still a pretty harsh environment for a pedestrian over there. And the large scale of the couple of big projects that are coming 1st worry me from that perspective, because it's still so auto oriented. So, I think as you come back, it's to, to truly dig in there and see what you guys can do as an early project to start to change that. I'm skeptical, I have to be honest, but I'm hopeful. So, there you go. Yeah, that's you, All right, we have a motion and a second. There's also some design review comments on here. So, when you come back, maybe you can address those too. Um, Michael, call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Curry. Yes. Ray Scott. Yes. Paul. Yes. Motion carries. Looking forward to seeing you again. Thank you all so yes. much. I also want to acknowledge Denise Van Lair who's on the call who from Fairfax has been a huge help. I didn't give her an opportunity to talk because you guys are pressed for time, but I just want to make sure everyone knows how helpful Fairfax has been. What a great partner for us. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great project. Thank you all. Okay, Far West Design Review. This is for the uh, MedVet Animal Hospital. Who's here for this one? I am Joe Kyle with MNA Architects, and we have uh, Paul Brown as well at, at, on behalf of the owner. Okay, if you can all raise your right hand, and then uh, when you say I do, please state your name. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury? I do, Joe Kyle. I do, Paul Brown. Okay, go ahead, please. All right, I just want to thank everyone for their time. We really appreciate you guys working with us. Um, you know, you, we've already kind of gone through this once, so we're going to do it again for final. Um, I believe we've addressed a lot of your concerns, but you know, just real quickly, we're going to go through this. Uh, as you can see here on the site, uh, this is just kind of give you guys an idea of where we're located. Um, you know, kind of the developments that are around there and where we are. Uh, next slide, please. Here, what we're trying to show is kind of what's happening across the street, ad the adjacent property, the, the, the main drive. Here, we're trying to just show, you know, hey, this is where we're going to be. We're showing the very first, you know, two thirds of the property. We have our development on that portion of it, and the back portion of it is, you know, it's going to be maintained as is and be consistent with what the Metro Parks requirements are. Next slide. I'm um, here. We're just kind of showing our site, kind of where we were ending off on the north side is where you know all that's going to stay and be remained. Um, we kind of curve in how you access the drive, and then kind of come in along the west side there. Uh, next slide. Um, here, what we're doing is we're kind of addressing the fact that we've you know met with you know as as requested, we met with uh, Brent, and we've got a recommendation of approval from the sewer district. So we've address that we have a pond to the north pond to the south and an existing pond to the uh, west there uh, next slide um here what we're trying to show is as you know we we've, we've at, we were asked basically to kind of improve some of the plantings and we along the front edge we kind of went with a little bit larger plants in the front and we had some things along this on along the west side but still engages that existing pond I kind of using it as accentuation points um, we were asked to uh, show a little bit of a walking path. So we have that hatched area and then in the front parking area uh, for all of our clients that are going to be there. Next slide. 
And here, this is kind of just, you know, kind of give you an overall concept. You know, some of the materials are metal panels. Uh, a lot of, you know, right there in the front, the main entry point is going to be a butt glaze system. And then to the left, it's going to be a storefront system. So really here on the south side, we're really kind of bringing it, letting it be warm. We're bringing in natural lighting. It's going to be a part of the healing process for this animal ho hospital. Um, next slide. Uh, here's just a little bit better of an angle of how you kind of enter into the carport. We have that, uh, um, which is we have the Eldorado stone there. Uh, just to kind of help ground the building a little bit and kind of help it be permanent into the fixture. Uh, next slide. Uh, just another angle from the front. Go ahead. Next. Uh, this is what it's going to look like from the behind. Uh, we have a little bit of a pet relief area from the back there, which is where that number 12 is and just an inset and kind of how we're kind of carving out little inset windows uh, throughout to help bring in lighting if we can. Uh, sometimes we're not going to be able to. We're going to have to try to box some of that in just for uh, cleaning purposes and for, you know, if in surgery processing. Um, so we're not able to always do that, but we're trying to do that for her to be nice to our neighbors. Next slide. Uh, here, this is going to be our access drive where you come in for the parking for the uh, for the uh, for the staff. Uh, as you can see, you'll have you'll come down that side way, and you'll see you know a lot of glass on that side. Um, it's you know it's just your main access point for the staff. Next slide. <laughs> here, we're kind of illuminating a little bit more of those materials of the uh, canopy. Basically, being the metal panels, the the bursa wall, you know, we're kind of showing some of the fencing material as actual metal panel as well, and then um, the drive it, you know, for around the other locations, and then the old castle glass, and you know, just our med bed blue size is what we're kind of indicating here. Next slide. You know, here what we're trying to give you guys an idea is just the overall heights, you know, with the maximum height of what we like to call the Mohawk at 22 feet. And then the uh, rooftop screen area at, I think, it, I can't read it right now. I think it's at 20, 26, maybe. Um, 26. It, yeah. Thank you. And then the canopy at 15, where you kind of drive in. If there's, an, if there's an issue, you drive in, you drop them off, and you kind of enter into that space there. So we're just trying to show some heights and give you guys an idea of what, you know, we're thinking from proximities. Uh, next slide. Here again is that. Side that you come in as you drive by, um, there's a little bit of a drop off zone in case that um, there is an issue um, uh, on that side where that door is. There's uh, some grief rooms right there. So if you need to kind of usher out there quietly, we're trying to address that. Um, next slide. Here we kind of have this being elevated and kind of detailed out um, on where we are. Next slide. And I think that's it. So we're just trying to show, you know, we've thought this out. We're looking at the reveal systems. We're looking at how the spacing of all the storefront is, the spacing of uh, the butt glazing. So any other Mr. questions? Mr. Chair, I'd like to move to approve, please. Okay, motion to approve uh, for final. And I'll second. Motion is second, further discussion. Michael, call the roll, please. Owen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. Hurry. She may have stepped away. Trey Scott. Yes. Paul. Sammy, are you here? Sounds like Sammy's gone. Sorry, I say yes. I apologize. I thought All it right. was. All right. Thanks, Lillian. Okay, motion carries. Good luck. Thank you very much. This, Appreciate your time. This is a proposed demolition of a two and a half story, uh, two family residential structure. Uh, this is at 15528 St. Clair Avenue. Who's here for this? Hi, my name is Steve Billington. I'm here on behalf of the Cuyahoga Land Bank. Okay, Steve, can you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury? I do. Go ahead. I want to thank the commission for allowing me to speak. Um, I am here to request approval for a demolition permit for 15528 St. Clair 
Avenue. I have a presentation I'll go quickly through. If you indulge me. Um, the first, uh, if you go back one, one slide, it just shows that um, beginning the front of the house as it's as it was in, in July when I was there. Uh, it's kind of overgrown and in, in poor shape. Um, you could go to the next page. You could see that it's here's an aerial view of a closer in and a little further out to show where it where it sits in the neighborhood. Um, there's a, a convenience store to the I guess west of the property. There's a privately owned vacant parcel of land the north east uh, direction. Um, there's a lot of commercial. Uh, Vacant land, frankly, in the neighborhood as well. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see pictures of that as it kind of shown as up and down the streets from the perspective of the house. Um, uh, next slide, please. Here's here's some exterior pictures of the property, in the front and the sides. Um, kind of you can see in one of the pictures at the top that it, it really abuts the the neighboring commercial properties a fence there, but in back it's overgrown and, and not very well kept, frankly. Uh, the next picture will, will show kind of an interior pictures from when we visited the property in July, I decided to acquire the property. It's um, since been cleaned out, but it's still kind of in a similar condition. Uh, and then the last group of pictures, from the interior of the house is in the basement. It kind of shows the dated uh, uh, utilities. So, Mr. Chair, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. This this appears to meet the criteria um, to to allow demolition. I move to approve. Okay. Second. Motion is second for the discussion. Michael, call the roll. Owen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. Curry. Hello, Ian. Hey, Scott. Yes. Motion carries. Uh, St. Francis School Electronic Messaging Center seeking uh, final approval. This is at 7119 Superior Avenue. Who's here for this? Anyone? Going once. Mr. Chair, I move the table. If we they they appear, we'll come back. Thanks. We have a motion to table. I'm I'm sorry. I this is Terry Fields. I I uh, was this for uh, St. John Cathedral? So, no, no. Uh, this is for uh, excuse me. Uh, this is for St. Francis School Electronic Message Center. Oh, and Mr. Chair, I see Charles Charles Williams is here. I see is his there? name? Yeah. He's muted. Can you take him off of mute? Uh, I can only send a request. I can't take them off to mute. I just sent a request. All right, keep moving we forward. Keep on moving. I can put it off to the side, and then if he shows up like the other guy, there's a motion made to take. There's a motion to table. Is there a second? I'll second it. Motion to second. Michael, call the roll. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Booker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Trey Scott. Yes. Okay, it's table. Uh, five points mural. Two. Our installation. Tara, are you going to start this? Yes. Good morning, Commission. Um, this morning. mural at 14805 St. Clair uh, was approved by the Northeast Design Review Committee on October 19th. Um, this is in War 10, and uh, this particular mural was prompted by another mural in the neighborhood um, that Greater Collinwood Development Corporation um, had uh, done the project for, and it prompted a church across the street to also get a mural. And um, I am in favor of the mural. It's being funded by uh, a Cuyahoga County Community Development Support Grant. And the artist, Bob Peck, is one that you all are very familiar with. He has several uh, murals around the city. 
And I am going to go ahead and turn this over to Crystal Sierra from the Greater Collinwood Development Corporation to go through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Good morning. Uh, Crystal Sierra here from Greater Collinwood Development Corporation. Um, we came before this committee um, in September of this year to present the Five Points uh, Intersection Streetscape Project. At that time, we were seeking approval for the uh, Hands of My Hood mural by artist Aaron Williams, which was approved and installed recently. Um, the Five Points Intersection Streetscape Project aims to implement recommendations of the 2018 St. Clair Corridor study conducted by city planning. Uh, with support from Councilman uh, Anthony Harrison and Councilman Michael Kalenzik. Uh, phase one of the project was a $50,000 investment uh, by way of Greater Collinwood and um, includes the installation of public art, bike racks, placemaking banners, crosswalk restriping, and vegetation control. Uh, phase two of the project was uh, funded in the amount of $50,000 in May of 2021. Uh, for a total investment of $100,000 in beautification for the intersection over two phases. The hub of activity is located at St. Clair, uh, East 152nd and Ivanhoe Road. And uh, this particular intersection is known as a hub for civic activities um, through placemaking, public art and beautification. The project is to elevate and preserve Five Points identity while also um, encouraging motorists and visitors to slow down and explore uh, rather than drive through. Next slide, please. GCDC hosted a series of public meetings to announce its intent to submit a proposal to Cuyahoga County for the CDSG grant uh, for grant years 2020 and 2021. During these public meetings, GCDC shared its vision uh, for the Streetscape project and gained feedback about the kinds of beautification efforts the community wanted to see. Greening public art identity, code enforcement, and spaces for youth were all topics of priority. Next slide, please. GCDC installed its first public mural, Hands of My Hood, by artist Aaron Williams in September of 2021 with approval from DRC and city planning. During the installation of the Aaron Williams mural, Pastor Terrell uh, Reddix from Greater Works Church of God in Christ inquired about public art for the outer facade of the church's building located across the street at 14805 St. Clair. Artist Bob Peck agreed to donate his work to the Five Points Project and GCDC has provided technical support, facilitated the mural mock-up and will absorb the cost of wall prep and supplies. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide contains um, Bob Peck's work uh, to the right. Um, the top image is of Starmart, Starmart, which was part of the spectacular vernacular project in Lakewood. Um, the bottom image shows um, uh, Lauren Najee's wall done in 2000, uh, done in 2021. Um, his recent um, Shows include the small, the small show group at 11 gallery and then don't panic brace for impact is an upcoming show. Next slide, please. So, this uh, slide contains uh, kind of the technical aspects of the wall the dimensions are 18 foot by 30 materials. We're going to use this aerosol and exterior exterior paint. Um, this will be at the west facing facade. Um, and then as part of the prep, um, you can see the ivy in the top image. Um, we've actually um, been treating the ivy root stock per design review suggestion to kill the ivy so it does not come back and we'll be uh, removing that. We're also facilitating quotes for the tree that's in that photo, um, which hasn't been maintenanced. Um, and then we will be um, power washing the wall to provide a clean surface. Next slide. So these are a couple of contextual photos. The photos on, or the photo on the left is um, east facing and across the street. The building itself or the um, well, mural are you? center of the photograph. And then the photograph to the right is west facing and the building is on the right. Next slide, please. 
So this is the five points um, uh, mural mock-up from Bob Peck. Um, he says, my abstract murals are all about pure design and energy. Energy, With every wall I do, my goal is to uh, brighten up the space that otherwise goes unnoticed or has the potential to be used to bring positive energy into the surrounding area. I create colorful works with a sense of movement that serve as public art, but also as a place that, I, that can be used by residents for anything from a photo backdrop to a local landmark or visual stimulus that simply brings a smile to someone's face. Uh, this uh, piece is untitled. Thank you. Commission members? Move to approve. Second. Motion and second. Further discussion? Michael. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. Curry. Uh, great mural, yes. McCray Scott. Yes. Good luck. Thank you very much. Here design review, Metro Health Apex new construction, seeking final approval. This is a 2500 uh, Metro Health Drive. Who's here for this one? Brad Fink with the Turner Perspective CBLH design build team, and then Mike Tobin and Robin Holmes from Metro Health. Okay, if you could all raise your right hand, you suddenly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury. Yes. You. Okay, um, we'll give just a brief overview of the project um, and also address some of the comments that came up in the SD review, uh, specifically configuration of the main entry and pharmacy drives, crosswalk site details. Um, in, in summary, the Outpatient administrative buildings, approximately 307,000 square feet over six floors, located just south of the new 11 story Glick Center Hospital that's under construction um, on Scranton Road. This project will house uh, health clinics and offices that are currently located in other buildings around campus, uh, many of which are moving from the existing outpatient pavilion along West 25th Street, uh, just across the street, uh, which is the site plan for that future uh, 12 acre park. Um, so. Uh, generally, uh, the building is designed to complement the neighboring Glick Center in both material and detail. So the rhythm of the vision glass and solid panels in the in the uh, elevation you see is derived from Glick patterns, but adapted to the program uh, within our building. So curtain wall is used at primary public areas along the first floor and up the elevator lobbies um, on all levels, and then larger window openings occur at waiting rooms. At the upper levels and there are narrower uh, openings occur at clinical administrative areas. So. For consistency of the experience and cohesive. Campus look and feel the materials match Glick. Um, the curtain wall finish vision glass, spandrel glass, stone base. Uh, and wood panel under the canopy are the materials and colors installed at Glick and opaque wall areas are uh, white aluminum metal panel. Uh, next slide. Uh, this, this is a diagram just demonstrating the primary circulation paths, uh, including the arrival uh, on the exterior of Glick and Apex along Scrant Road, um, and then the retail pharmacy pickup on the east side of the building, and also the connection between the visitor uh, parking garage uh, between that and Apex, uh, the O&E building, and, and Glick. Um, there's also a third floor uh, bridge that will provide uh, a clinical connection uh, to access the cancer center and I at normal surgery clinics. Next slide. This is a view of uh, the building from Scranton looking north. Um, you know, the building is placed to maintain visibility of both building entrances, both for the hospital and for the ONA building. Um, you can see that curtain wall that extends vertically uh, along the south elevation uh, at the stair tower. And then um, the building is set back just a little bit to be the drop off sequence and, and visibility to the Glick Tower. Uh, next slide. The next view is from West 25th Street looking south. Uh, next slide. And then a view from uh, the from West 25th of the West elevation. The next slide is a view of the main entrance. And that shows the, the sidewalk connecting both the hospital medical office buildings, creating a continuous concourse uh, and a covered drop off zone at the uh, outpatient administrative building. Next slide. 
Uh, this is a street sectional view uh, through the entry plaza in front of the ONA building. Uh, the entry walkway, the drive, the plaza, and sidewalk along Scranton are all at the same elevation with flush curbs, vehicular bollards, and planters at their edges. So that was one of the comments from the design review committee was the, the details of the, the pedestrian um, and vehicular sequence. Uh, the goal was to create a plaza and landscape zone along Scranton Road connected both to the campus walkways uh, and to the sidewalks along Scranton. Next slide. Um, so a lot of discussion uh, surrounded around the site plan and you know primary entrances for both uh, Glick and Apex are along Scranton Road. Uh, entrances from the visitor garage and service, service access and pharmacy drive through are from the view road side of the building. And the site plan showing the conditions of the site at the time that this project um, is underway, specifically uh, the view road and Scranton Road configuration, the configuration of uh, South Point Drive, which is to the left um, intersecting with Scranton Road. Um, one comment we heard from the SD review was the orientation of the uh, pharmacy drive and it previously had a pretty sharp turn into the uh, into that drive. So we've addressed that uh, to provide it more perpendicular, more navigable turnaround um, and better separation with the service drive. Um, we're also providing uh, in this updated plan, uh, the sidewalk, continuous sidewalk along Scranton, um, crossings at, at each uh, drive apron and then crossings at Scranton. Um, the driveway entry, uh, with this side uh, to match the width of the other drives at Glick, um, which narrowed it some, somewhat from the initial uh, submission. Um, and then the drives in front of uh, the outpatient administrative building uh, provides for a dedicated lane for drop off along the curb, a second lane for valet uh, and shuttle service, and then a third lane allowing for passing uh, for uh, those that are either exiting or continuing to the Glick Center entrance. Um, as I said, uh, in the last meeting, crossings at Scranton were suggested, so we're anticipating a crossing at both the, the South Point uh, entrance or South Point Drive at the left side of the page and then a crossing um, at the south side of the drop-off drive. Um, and then there was some discussion about the location of the crosswalk um, and as the park is developed across the street, um, you know, Metro being open minded to alternative crossing locations as the details of the park are developed. Um, in the plan here, you also see um, in, in uh, greater detail, there's benches, trash receptacles, um, pedestrian scale lighting fixtures, bicycle racks, and um, a lot of the pedestrian amenities that we're looking for at both the Scranton entrance and then the uh, East entrance. Uh, next slide. Um, also uh, developed since the last presentation is a landscape plan um, highlighting those site accessories, but also the diversity of plantings, um, trees, shrubs, and perennials, largely native, um, providing visual interest and seasonal color, and um, uh, placed uh, you know, with, with a row of trees along Scranton View Road, and then also a, a lower row of trees in front of the glass at the first floor breast center. Um, at the south south end of the building, um, and then evergreens uh, at the connection between the garage and uh, the apex building, um, and the service drive. Uh, next slide is the palette of plantings um, and the specific planting types. Next slide is the site furnishings um, that are being provided, uh, and those. Next slide show the uh, site furnishings that match those being provided at the Glick Center. Next slide. And we'll go into detail, but uh, elevations of each uh, side of the building. And the next slide, uh, floor plans, just showing the functions of the spaces and general configuration. Um, with that, any comments or questions would be uh, much appreciated. Chair. Mr. Uh, Members, Mr. Can you hear me, Mr. Chair? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm disappointed 
only because when the hospital was here before us previously, you know, there was lots of conversation about what's happening happening with the park across the street. Now, naturally, you know, I've we've seen some semblance of a design or consideration when when the um, when the master plan was submitted and presented to us in a special meeting. Um, I just feel like we're going to be sort of handcuffed because they're going to make decisions based upon not being informed how this interacts, how these two, how the buildings and how the space around it. It's, it's not a postage stamp. There's there's things that impact one's ability to, to cross that street. I have a problem with just trying to identify two crosswalks. I've seen very successful tabletops introduced at campuses, college campuses where there's parking or where there's people crossing the street where people can cross safely. And it's a traffic calming feature. So I, I, I again, I'm just uncomfortable with where this is going. And I just wanted to cite my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Quick question for you. When do you think you're coming back with the park for design? I think um, either Mike or Robin, are you able to address that question? Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah go ahead, Mike. I, I, I don't have a, a specific date. Um, I, I know we want to get going on the construction here and and the, the related parking so so it can be open um when you know all all in unison uh it's our intent to to bring in professionals to help develop that that park and make it the the you know the uh the jewel of, of the neighborhood as as this group voted on a couple of weeks ago as part of uh, clark fulton as part of the master plan. Mr. Chairman, if I if I may, um, uh, first and foremost, just want to say acknowledging uh, Commissioner Fluker's uh, statement, but I do want to really emphasize the point and the rigor of the work that has taken place between the community, the hospital, the city, Metro West, the councilwoman, with this entire endeavor and making sure that we get the best out of this, which I know, uh, Mr. Fluker is your goal as well. Um, but with respect to the park, which is going to take, uh, obviously some time to, uh, detail out and to implement. Um, I do understand that interface and the desire to make sure that that interface happens in a way that's pedestrian oriented. There is a necessity, uh, obviously, however, to make sure that, you know, this campus master plan continues to move forward. Because we believe that it is a part of creating the momentum for the neighborhood and the community. And I'm speaking as a resident, not just as a uh, uh, professional. Uh, and I just want to say, acknowledging that, you know, I hope this is not a situation where this gets uh, slowed down. If there are adjustments that could be made, great. But again, keeping this momentum going in the Clark Fulton community, just coming off of our uh, plan adoption. I think is very important and I think with respect to the, uh, you know, hospital, you know, being as sensitive as possible um, to being able to uh, sort of do, it's the small things that actually matter when you think about it. So, you know, some of the things that were brought up uh, by Mr. Fluke, or if those could be accommodated, um, you know, we should make every effort to do so. However, we need to make sure that this momentum and the investment continues to happen. Uh, with respect to the campus transformation, because it's so pertinent for our neighborhood. Thanks, Mr. Uh, Mr. Carr. I appreciate that. I guess what I'm trying to say is this institution has a huge carbon in, uh, footprint. The, the amount of stress just from an environmental standpoint that this hospital puts on this community is, is it's enormous. And all I'm simply saying is we need to be more intentional about how we treat residents and how people come and go. And and I, I just, 
you know, again, I'm not, I'm not advocating for holding up this effort. What I am advocating for is not causing how one gets across the street to be an afterthought. Because when afterthoughts happen, then those solutions don't don't solve the inherent problem, the inherent problem of people moving, the inherent problem of, of kids crossing streets, you know, traffic turning into driveways. You know, that's 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 what we're talking about. And I don't think it's been totally thought out. Thank you. Thank you. Other commission members. Um, I so I'll make a motion to approve, um, but with August point noted, so that the next time we see this project or another project in this plan, um, that we really see, especially Grant, and I think his points well taken about the fact that even on this plan, the crosswalks look very unintentional, um, and sort of like you know, relative to how many people will be coming to either center, the click center or the center. So we're going to prove this and move it forward, but have you know that next time you come back, we want to see a full sort of pedestrian kind of experience and know that I think the city also has to support the idea of um, kind of more colorful, wider crosswalks, patterns, you know, those sorts of things that haven't been quite developed. So we're just making sure you know that next time we see you, we're going to want to see that incorporation, not just in the park planning, but in some of the other projects as they come in. And I think, I think that's, that's a great point. I mean, basically just the pedestrian experience needs to be as, uh, you know, parapassu with how you're thinking about the automobile. And right now it doesn't seem that way. So even though we'll move this forward, um, we want you to know that it's of concern to this commission. Mm -hmm. I'll second. Yeah. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Further discussion. Thank you, Lillian, for articulating our position. I re-articulated it. Your position. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Booker. Yes. Hurry. Yes. McCray Scott. She's left. She's left. Okay. Motion carries. Good luck. We're moving on to Metro Health Apex Garage, new construction, final sorry, approval. David, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, the form of the sign for uh, St. Francis, uh, they have, they're, they're ready to go if, if you want to go back. It's up to you. Well, let's do the, the garage because it's next in line. And Metro Health waited. So, is there anyone new that's going to be speaking to this? Uh, I'm not new. I think I spoke the last time. Uh, last time we had a meeting for the schematic design approval. This is Jeff gonna, Jackson with Desmond. Yeah, I'm going to have to swear you in. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall enter under the penalty of perjury? Yes, I do. Go ahead. Uh, also, just uh, for for your information, uh, Sal uh, Rini with uh, Prospectus. Uh, we'll join in on the conversation a little bit later, later and uh, Mike Tobin and Robin Holmes, who just were available for the last presentation, will also be available. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you very much um, for giving us your time this morning. Uh, we are here to talk about the, uh, the Apex parking garage, which will serve both the uh, Apex building as well as the Glick building, uh, ultimately. And... Um, this was presented uh, to the Near West Committee last last week. Um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, Salvatore Rini will be discussing the um, the future facade concepts uh, later in this presentation. Um, but I wanted to go through the garage kind of quickly as a summary. Um, you guys have seen this approximately a month ago, uh, but in general, the garage will uh, be approximately two hundred seventy three thousand square feet with eight hundred seventy five parking spaces. Again, serving um, the Apex building as well as the Glick building. Um, it's located east of the Apex built, uh, outpatient administrative services building and south of the Glick Center. Um, the structure will be set back from View Road, uh, 33 feet, and um, 33 feet on one side, 40 feet on another. Total footprint of the garage is about 300 by 185. 
um, and the building is designed as a four level, four supported level, um, five story cast in place parking structure. Um, you know, our goal today is to, uh, for approval of the, uh, the structural component of the garage so that it can be uh, opened uh, in anticipation of the Glick uh, opening as well. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, this is just a utility grading plan. You can skip that to the next one. This is an existing conditions drawing. The next one is a storm management plan. Um, next one is uh, perspectives of the garage in relationship to both the Glick and the Apex building. It's kind of tucked in uh, behind those structures uh, and will be seen mostly from View Road and, and not really much and from the highway slightly as well, which um, Salvatore will also be talking about. Slide. Color and materials for the garage itself, excluding the, the future uh, facade that, that Salvatore will be talking about, are um, very similar to uh, the Glick Center and also the Apex Building, which will be um, but glazed uh, curtain wall with um, uh, bronze um, bronze metal materials. Um, the garage itself is pretty much concrete. Elevators are uh, stainless steel. And they look like white. There's not a lot of elements of the garage um, to speak of in terms of materials. Next slide. Site plan wise, uh, which you've just seen, uh, it's nestled in between the two buildings off of U Road. Uh, the main entrance to the garage is kind of towards the top left, um, which vehicles will come in and then start to circulate through the building. The main exit from the garage is sort of at the, the right side um, that gets you out of the structure. Um, so both allow plenty of queuing in terms of you know ingress and egress. Go to the next slide. This is just showing the ground level entry area. Keep going. This is the uh, first level exiting as well as circulation up through the garage. So you come up the ramp, uh, make a right. You can search and find up through the garage. Keep going. It's another level, it's a typical level. This is the roof level, which is actually set back along uh, View Road. So that the, the there's a setback along that portion of the garage, so it's not as uh, viewable from from there. Uh, these are typical elevations of the essentially the uh, frame structure of the garage, not the um, future skin. These are the east and west elevations, or north and south, depending on how you're looking at it. Main stair and elevator tower, which accesses the uh, the Apex building. It's simple sections. Uh, and with that, I would like to turn this over to Salvatore uh, Rini from Prospectus. He's a principal with them, and he'll be talking about the um, the future uh, facade concepts. Thanks, Jeff. I, I think um, just to add to Jeff's description of the garage, one thing that'll be a good lead into what I'm going to show you with these. These two additional informative slides are that the garage structure is being designed with anchors and uh, structural support for this future facade that we're going to talk about. Um, so, when we had schematic design approval, both from uh, planning and the near west design, the, the two primary comments we, we got back were, um, what, what are your thoughts on, on the facade of this garage? What's it going to look like? What's the design concept? And the other comment we heard uh, was, well, how visible, how visible is the garage and where is it visible from? So I'll start there and I, I know we're short on time, so I'll go quickly and we'll circle back with, with questions. But this simply is some photos where we think the garage would be most visible. And I wanna stress that we took, we took a lot of effort to determine where would be um, most visible from areas outside of campus. So the lower right 
um, image is an aerial view of the campus when the master plan is fully implemented. And you'll see that the, the north and the west uh, facades uh, of the garage will not be visible, or at least views from the north and west. Uh, you'll have the parkway that, that Mr. Fluker talked about wanting to see more. Uh, you'll see the Glick and Apex building, which creates that urban edge on Scranton. The visibility of the garage will really be from the east facade and the south facade. Uh, specifically, two views traveling north uh, on I-71, and then one view traveling south on 176. So, you know, uh, Commission, and on my screen, this is very small, but the image of or profiles of the both the apex building and the garage are dashed in. And you'll see uh, from 176, which is the lower left image, is really a, a 700 foot window of when you're driving by that you'll actually be able to see any part of campus. So on the right hand side of that image, you get a little glimpse of a, a 20 plus foot retaining wall concrete that blocks any view when you're when you're driving south. Um, I will say further north of, of this image. As soon as you pass that that concrete uh, retaining wall, you do begin to see campus, and uh, you can see the dash line of blue and white on the left hand side of uh, of the image. When trees are in full leaf or full bloom, if if they're flowered, you don't see anything. Now, when when in winter months, um, you'll be able to see through, and then that that really begins to play into how we're we're going to present some concepts of the facades. Similar views up on top, uh, starting with the left. This is um, as you enter Metro Health Curve. Again, not very visible when, when trees are in full leaf. Um, and these views, just so you know, are, are dead on accurate because we overlaid them with the existing massing so that we could get the exact view. So you're you're seeing the massing of the garage and the building behind. Um, again, when when it's winter, which we, we get a lot of here, you will be able to see through, but I think that'll support the concept of, of facade that we're going to show you. And then just to continue on, I believe what is the most visible is when you're at the apex or the center of Metro Health Curve um, and the, you know, the Glick uh, Tower becomes the jewel you do begin to see to the left um, the garage and the apex building. So we, we wanted to share that because I, I think, uh, I don't wanna say confusion, but there was questions on how visible or how <clears throat> not visible the garage would be. So if we could go to the next slide. You know, we had a lot of comp conversation with Near West as well as planning when we came in from for the schematic design about you know, why the garage facade was being delayed or um, not planned at the same time of the garage. And the, the simple answer to that is this garage serves both Glick and Apex. Glick is gonna open in October of 2022. We really need to get this garage up and running. So the facade projects are part of a bigger effort or a larger phase that involves not only the, the facades of this garage, but the facades of the visitor garage. There's also a number of facades with existing buildings that are gonna be required once Glick is occupied and those existing buildings become demolished. So there's a larger phase of facade work um, that we really wanna be able to look at as a whole from an aesthetic standpoint, and we're just not there yet with the design. So um, there's a commitment from Metro Health that these garages will be, um, um, we'll have future facades and we will go through near west and planning to, to review those. So in terms of concept, we started to look at the bigger picture concept of uh, Metro Health, which is a hospital in the park, right? Um, with, which coincides exactly with the Clark Fulton master plan. And we wanted to begin to create a facade that, that had a bigger picture of nature. So the, we simply started with, with a photograph of uh, some overlapping branches in the Metro parks and thought, 
wouldn't it be great if we can compose materials in a way so that when you step back further and you get those views from from the south and the east that you begin to see this bigger picture of nature right and some of the materials that we're studying are a mosaic of, of uh, solid metal panels um, we're also studying um, some screening with different levels of perforation um, or even possibly a facade of of more of a a fiberglass uh, netting that would have a printing of different tone on tone that creates that silhouette so that when you do step back and quite honestly, not only from uh, from outside the campus, but views from inside the building, even though this is not the focal point, you begin to get that feeling of nature uh, and that bigger picture of, of a hospital in the park. Um, and then, you know, also inside the garage, when you start to create these overlapping um, materials that that let different kinds of light in, it's going to get, start to give you a feel of uh, of light uh, coming through a, a canopy in the forest, if you will, just different levels uh, coming in. So this this concept is is not uh, final. Uh, we're advancing it. We're looking at at other concepts, but the commitment here and and the conversation we want to have is that. We are planning for this and uh, we will bring it in front of near West design as well as the uh, planning commission for final approval. Thank you. Commission members. So what they're seeking is final approval on the garage, but not the facade. I'll move approval downing. Second, Fluker. Motion second. Further discussion. Michael, call the roll. I'm going to call the roll. Michael had to uh, step away. Oh, uh, okay. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. McCray Scott. I'm still here too. Yes, Curry. Oh, Lily. <laughs> Quit trying to skip over me. Yes. No. <laughs> Just kidding. He was worried. No. He's like <laughs> the architectural ghillie suit. Uh, Paul. I don't think she's here. Oh, she's not here. Okay. All right. Okay. So. Motion carries. Good luck. Yep. Thank you. Looks like okay, so I guess. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it looks like uh, uh, Mr. Fluker is going to be leaving shortly. Uh oh. Where are we with um, the did, did we want to go back to the Franciscan uh, St. Francis uh, School Electronic Message Board, or do you want to yes. go move forward? Since they were late, let's keep on moving forward with uh, Harbor 44. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Okay, Harbor 44 Phase 2 uh, housing. Townhomes, new construction. This is at uh, 2035 West 44th Street. Who's here for this one? Hi, this is Antonia Marinucci. I'm the architect on the project. Uh, good, morning. Uh, good morning. Please raise your right hand. Do you silently swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury? Yes. Go ahead. Um. Hello to the I try commission. to make it snappy so you can get I would this. love to. <laughs> so uh, we're here with um, what we're calling Harbor 44 Phase 2. We're on West 44th Street, just south of Lorraine, and we're presenting the next um, two different concepts on adjacent blocks, the Harbor Flats and the Harbor Row. Next slide, please. Project context site location. Um, again, we're in Ohio City neighborhood. 44th and Lorraine. Um, next slide. Two blocks um, adjacent to one another, both vacant, at least the parcels that we're working with. Um, the southern block has two existing uh, homes on it. Next slide. Um, so the first phase of this project by the same developers, I was not the architect in this project, but it was a um, commercial Building at the corner of Lorraine and 44th. It was recently completed this summer with first floor retail, second floor office space. Um, and the goal is to continue um, this uh, 
the language of that development as we move south along West 44th Street. Next slide, please. Um, so this is photos of the completed project. Sherwin Lands is the anchor tenant at the corner. If you're familiar with the project site, um, I guess it opened, finished earlier, uh, finished at the end of the summer, and we are going to move down, kind of march along the context of 44th. Next slide. This is the kind of existing conditions of the northern block, or what we're going to refer to as the northern block between um, Apple Avenue and um, Orchard Avenue. Next slide. I'm sorry, Lorraine Court and Apple Avenue. Um, the next block I refer to as the southern block throughout this presentation, also the exist current existing conditions that you can see. Next slide, please. Um, further context on West 44th Street, um, mostly concentrated on the east end of the block, um, directly across from this project site. Next slide, please. And then this is a little bit more interior, neighboring, residential, um, as we sort of move between West 44th and 42nd. Um, pretty typical Ohio City um, housing stock, both single family and multifamily homes. Next slide, please. Um, so the site plan, um, and we're at schematic level design. Um, this is the Harbor Flat site plan. Um, part of the project requirements with land bank were to include a designated amount of parking spaces on this parcel. Um, hence why there is so much parking. Um, a lot of it will service the retail and commercial building to the north. And the goal of the flats plan was to shield the parking from West 44th um, and ease that transition from a commercial corridor to the residential part of the neighborhood. We're proposing a three-story, 12-unit apartment building um, that consists, each floor plate consists of one studio apartment, two one-bedroom apartments, and one two-bedroom apartment um, with the goal of providing a scale of affordability and access points for renters. Next slide, please. This is looking at a schematic level elevation, front elevation facing West 44th, as well as um, schematic level floor plans, detailing each of those um, units. We worked with city planning and Ohio City Inc. to establish um, the first floor as walk-up units. Um, every unit will have exterior space, including a walled terrace approach um, on those uh, first floor units, which we think is a little bit unique. and. Um, very friendly neighborhood addition at this location. Next slide, please. Um, looking at the next block down, the southern block as I refer to it, is the Harbor Row site plan. We're proposing seven townhomes that will front West 44th Street in either couples and or a triple configuration. Five of the units are going to be two bed. Um, I'm sorry, all of the units will be two bed, five of the units will be two car garages and two will be one car garages. Um, and then we are proposing the creation of a shared driveway. Hey guys. On the... Yes. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, on the rear half of this site, we are gonna, or we're proposing four new homes um, that will front Apple Avenue and West 43rd Place. Um, and we are taking inspiration from the classic English meal. Um, the alley is actually in pretty good condition, and we want to continue the tradition of smaller um, alley homes that you see commonly throughout Ohio City, as well as, again, providing an array of affordable price points um, for, for entry uh, to home ownership. So the mews will be, um, have, off street parking spaces designated on the parcel um, and will vary between one and two bedrooms, 800 square feet to I believe the largest is 1400 square feet. Next slide, please. And then we're looking at um, this is focusing on the front, you know, the West 44th facing townhomes, trying to continue the language, um, kind of a modern interpretation of the federal townhouse row home approach um, we like to propose oh, I get into material a little bit later um, the this site is out of the historic district but we wanted to kind of 
keep an eye towards towards those design requirements um, in hopes of providing an elevated sort of product um, in terms of the quality of design. Next slide, please. This is a look at those kind of typical floor plates, the 22 foot wide unit and the 16 foot wide unit. Next slide, please. This is a elevation view of the new structures. You can see three are coupled together. And then there's one that is freestanding facing Apple. Um, the configuration, um, the preference from city planning was that the one faced Apple. Um, and same sort of idea, just a pretty uh, looking towards the historic simple row home, taking a lot of um, cues from the existing homes um, in the surrounding area with a simple gable um, and window uh, pattern. Next slide, please. That's a typical floor plate plan for the news. Next slide. Oh, thank you. So then now we are getting into materiality scale um, and a little bit of context for the Harbor Flats. Um, at this level, we're proposing an ivory brick um, in hardy cladding at the insets, um, fiberglass doors um, and vinyl windows for affordability, but the client was adamant that we um, are using material that you know, stood the test of time in this neighborhood and that's full brick and cladding. And so that will carry along into the Harbor Row townhomes um, that are going to be both, again, hardy board and brick um, with a standing seam aluminum roof. Next slide, please. And this is looking at how the scale and context, um, like I said, we wanna create a gradient from that retail corridor into the residential. Um, the Harbor Flats are about a foot off of the current retail um, Building. Next slide. In height, I should say. Harbor Row is again um, consistent in that height pattern as we step through. Next page, please. And then looking as we kind of turn the corners, seeing how the, the muse again continue to soften from in height and density between that row home on 44th and into the interior of the neighborhood as we move toward West 42nd. Um, cladding. Oh, the cladding um, will be the main material for the uh, new homes. And we are again proposing to kind of carry that bricked terrace um, to give a little bit of separation between the alley front and the you know front facade of these buildings and provide outdoor space at each unit in the rear. Okay, I think that covers it. All right, thank you. So this is uh, for schematic design approval, commission yeah. members. Um, I'm a of approval. I really like the design a lot. I also like the kind of thoughtful site plan as well. So um, I think it's quite nice. I'll second. Yeah. We have a motion and second further discussion. Someone call the roll, whoever. Bowen. Yes. Downey. Yes. Luker. Curry. Yes. McCray Scott. Not here. Okay. Okay, Paul. Yes. Uh, is Paul back? Is Paul here? No. Okay. So we're down to three commission members? Yes. Means we, we don't, don't have, have a quorum. We don't have a quorum. Is that correct, Freddie? That is correct, because we only have three. Okay. Of the seven. All right. So under I mean, those there's... under those conditions, you can hear the remainder of the cases, but we would not be able to take action on them until the uh, following meeting. Mr. Chairman, right. I I really think we shouldn't go forward. I mean, we're going to have to go through it again because the other four or five members need to hear the presentations. Yeah, for them to vote, for sure. I believe Ms. Curry is leaving in 10 minutes as well. Yeah, so that's even going to make it worse. It'll be two of us. All right. 
So um, we need to put these in the front, the ones that didn't get seen in the front of the next meeting. Yes. Mr. Chairman, how many can I also? Are... How many are left? Pardon me? How many are left? Oh, we have quite a few. Uh, St. Francis. St. Francis. Looks like before eight. Before that, that's two, three. Oh, that would be nine then. Four. Wow. Yeah, we have quite a few left, nine. Mr. Chairman, can I suggest that in the future, if we have a presentation that does not require a vote, that it be put at the end of the agenda? I realize there are consultants from out of town and different time zones, but, you know, we, we really need to be um, thoughtful about uh, timing on these different projects and what people need to have in approvals, in voted approvals before they can go forward, so. Uh, I, Freddie and I talked about that earlier this morning. Um, and then the other thing is we just need to make sure that we clear our schedules for these meetings. These meetings are real important. Yeah, but they should not take this long. We should really manage the meetings more. I mean, they've seen all the design review. We don't need to see all the interior floor plans. We don't need to see a lot of this stuff. They should not be going through the full presentations. We are only, the exteriors only our purview. Um, so I, I feel like the uh, staff needs to manage the presenters a little bit better for what we need to see, um, because this is a reoccurring thing. We, we, when we were in person, we've never gone bef very rarely past 1230. So we need to figure out how to get this back on track. But we have a lot of people. I mean, this was a large. Book of projects in front of us this time. And even and, even more to my point that if it's not for a vote, it needs to go at the end. Right. The, the, the other part of it is sometimes you need to see some of the inside so you can understand the form on the outside. So you, you're right. We don't need to see where the furniture lays out or whatever, but uh, you do need to understand the program to understand the, the facility on the outside. So, all right, uh, we're going to adjourn this meeting. Freddie, why don't you and I get together and talk about the next one and getting these things lined up in a way that we can go through it quickly for the next group of people that um, are Mr. Bowen. Yes. With um, all due respect, this is Charles Williams from St. Francis. Um, I had problems with my phone. I did not, I, were, I was not late. And um, I'll be open to whatever kind of meetings or things that you guys have us do in order to get that signed down. Yeah, it, it'll be in two weeks. And we'll put you at the front of the, the program. Sorry, you went out again. The next meeting will be in two weeks and we'll put you in the front of the uh, meeting. All right, and I apologize. No, that's okay. We understand about technical difficulties. Thank you. And thank you so much. Okay, meetings adjourned. Thank you.